Right, thanks everybody. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the final Education and Children's Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee of the Municipal Year. Um, I'm a bit croaky, so just bear with me. Um, before we start these proceedings, may I bring to your attention some housekeeping matters. There's no expected fire alarm testing today, so if the fire alarm sounds, please follow the fire and emergency procedures that are applicable to the council house. Please can I ask you use your microphone when addressing the meeting and it's switched off when you're not using it and that your mobile devices are turned to silent. This meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of subsequent repeated viewing by entering the Warspike room and during the meeting, councillors are consenting to being filmed and to the use of those recordings for webcasting purposes. So we move on to item number one. Uh, which is apologies. Jake, can you tell us about any apologies, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies from Councillor Dr Cree, Councillor Tippett is substituting, and Councillor Deacon has also provided apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tippett, for um, subbing today. And also, um, just note that we've got two new members of the committee for this meeting. Um, so welcome to Councillor Riley and to Councillor McClay. Um, so we move on to item two, which is declarations of... Oh, yeah. Get me. But I'm you, new too. I'm you were, just a returner, really. Yeah, but you were you were, you were meant to be at the last meeting, didn't you? I was. You were. But I couldn't make it because of a family no, crisis. No, I realise that. But so Thank you. I do apologise. But you, you're not new as of today. Not brand new. <laughs> That's the point I'm, I'm making. I'm recycled. But very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. All the same. Thank you. So sorry. Yeah. On to declarations of interest. Um, I was declare that I'm a. Governor of the um, Horizon Multi Academy Trust, um, Councillor Riley. Um, I'm a governor with Ted Rag Trust also. Any other declarations? No. Lovely. So we will move on to item three, which is the minutes. Um, does anybody have any items they would like to raise about the minutes of the last meeting? So I think we can declare those an accurate record. Do I have a proposal? Anybody would like to second? Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I don't have any urgent business. So um, we'll move on to item five, which is tracking decisions. And I thought the best way to deal with tracking decisions was just for people to um, raise anything on the tracking decisions log that they wanted us to discuss. So I hand it over to anybody who's got anything to raise. If you've got something to raise, then raise your hand. Okay. Councillor Beer. Thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, looking back on your um, previous tracking, I don't see any mention ever of child sexual exploitation. And it's been a while since this committee has looked at that. And I just feel we need to keep our finger on the pulse with regards to those events in, that could be possibly happening within our city. And it would be nice just to have a, a little update at some stage on um, any child sexual exploitation that is happening in, within our city or anything surrounding that whole topic of exploitation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beer. Um, I, if you raise that at the end, when we talk about the work programme, obviously it's you know to, to, to the discretion of whoever is the chair after May, but we can add it, um, an update of that nature to the work programme. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anybody else? Count, uh, Councillor Brasdale. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly on the response to the school uniform motion. Um, so thank you to Councillor Carlisle for communicating that to the, the schools involved. Um, it was actually really good to see the number of schools who responded um, to have half of all of the city's secondary schools. I think it's quite good going within a, a relatively short time frame. And I thought there were some really positive outcomes in, in what the schools were drawing attention to with regards to policies and that the reviews had already happened. Um, one slight worry is that the schools who are pleased about progressive elements of their policy are perhaps more likely to respond and perhaps that the ones who haven't had a chance might be the ones who need to do further work on that. Um, but I was wondering in terms of moving this topic forward um, as a potential recommendation whether 
um, as part of the bulletin that goes out to head teachers, whether there could be an opportunity to share good practice. So to maybe to choose three schools as case studies um, that have, have responded very positively to this um, so that all head teachers can see work that is happening elsewhere in Plymouth. Um, not saying that they need to, to copy or emulate that, but just to give them some food for thought in case of future reviews. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Charles. Yeah, more than happy to do that. We also have a head teacher's briefing um, once every half term. We did put it on the last briefing. We can put it on again. So both in the newsletter and in that briefing as well. Thank you. So can we say then that that's a recommendation that we would like two or three case studies from the people who responded positively of, and if they were happy to be identified, great. If they want to be anonymous, then fine. Um, just as a, an extra nudge to other schools. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think the response rate is higher than I was expecting, actually. Um, so I think that's that's really, really good work. And to remember that that all, all dates back to a member of Youth Parliament, um, you know, working with, with Tom around um, bringing a motion to Council about this. So, so I think it's really worth remembering that. Um, Councillor Creswell? Apologies, sorry, Chair. Um, I just wanted to raise a sort of a kind of a, a, a general thing is that um, one of the basis of how quickly we actually get some of these responses, because some of the things have actually only just arrived. Um, one of them would have been, I think, which is something that I requested, which was the um, uh, Plymouth Education Board. And that I thought would be fairly stra straightforward terms of reference and who was actually on it. Um, could have come immediately. And the other thing I want to raise, which I which I know is very close to um, Councillor Lang's heart, is the um, are these letters that we were sending regarding um, regarding the response to the um, Josh McAllister recommendations and such. Now, the first time we talked about actually sending a letter was back in the October meeting, the thirteenth of October meeting. Um, and then that letter hadn't been sent when we had the meeting on December the 9th of December. Um, the, um, there has been one letter that was sent which was generally about funding, which is on the 31st of January. Uh, but of course, on the 2nd of February, the government actually made its, um, its uh, well, it released a press release, didn't it, uh, responding to um, jo Josh McAllister's recommendations, which were quite significantly different to certainly to the, the finance that was uh, suggested Josh McAllister's recommendations and I just feel that we've kind of like almost um, missed an opportunity I don't know if necessarily if we had uh, done so the government would have had a big rethink because they got a letter from Plymouth City Council but I do think it's important and I would like to ask really specifically what is the expectation in terms of the time that would be reasonable in terms of actually drafting and sending a letter. I would have thought two weeks would be probably mm -hmm. fairly um, fairly reasonable. Everyone's got very high um, English communication skills here, and I can't see that it would be particularly difficult or particularly challenging. Thank you. Yeah. Sharon, do you want to respond? Yeah, um, I, th I think the, the reason for that, as you'll, you'll know, um, Councillor Creswell, is that we've had a number of leadership roles and gaps in, in that, and um, with Jean leaving, um, with Ming leaving and then replacements for Jane and Annie. Um, I'm very aware of the issue and we are going through and have gone through a programme looking at our forward plan. So I think some of it has been caught up through um, for, for performance, for example, um, whilst Ming left, we had that gap in that place. And then obviously we had Jean leaving and on transition to Jane and an offset inspection in, in the middle of that process. So I think unusual times, nonetheless, um, we've met as a DNT, we're looking at our forward programme plan, and we wouldn't expect to encounter those delays going forward, including some of the tracking items that have sat with officers that just haven't reached through to Jake and the team. And we've had a conversation um, last week and today about making sure that doesn't happen again. I think in terms of the expectation of two weeks, it depends on what the matter is, because we need to be very mindful and purposeful and intentional in our response. <laughs> So there will be situations when I don't think two weeks would be appropriate. Um, <clears throat> but nonetheless, the point you make is valid. We have had exceptional circumstances, and I'm confident going forward those delays won't happen again. So, I, I mean, I accept that, except the fact that the two weeks and such. But I assumed that there was actually a kind of like um, 
I don't know, a, a target, a, a system that exists not just for, say, this committee, but for all committees of what would be the recommended sort of um, expectation, uh, which kind of does kind of sort of like um, surprise me in, in terms of like um, reaching reaching targets and, and what's actually sort of, I'd expect some of those things to be kind of laid down and probably laid down not just for this committee, but for several committees. So I'll, I'll link with Ross and we'll have that conversation and, and then set those clear expectations and with officers we'll meet them. I, mean, I would just add, I think that um, it's a shame about the Josh McAllister letter. I, th I think we should still send it because this committee wants it sent, but we've really missed the boat on it. And I think it might need to be rewritten um, in light of the fact that the government's response has already come out. And I, I, I think a fair... A fair um, expectation would be that if you if if the committee asks for something to happen in a committee, it would have happened by the next one, um, and it, not that it has one of them hasn't even happened by the the one after. So I just I, you know I understand there are reasons and all the rest of it, but I think if it's going to be delayed to such an extent as to become fairly um, tame letter because of the passing of time and things that have happened in the interim, then I think it would be good for us to know that. Okay, thank you. Um, any other things on the tracking decisions that anybody would like to raise? Councillor Harrison. Uh, I'd just like to add um, to what uh, Councillor Cresswell's just said, because the response to my question, which was from June, um, has, only, uh, has only just come through, and really it's a bit of a half-hearted uh, response that really doesn't actually give any information, not the information I requested, certainly. Um, about you know sort of a, a system needing still to be put in, in place you know developing the resources for it well that doesn't sound like it's anywhere near ready for completion to give give the information so uh, as I say I have you know that's we're now more than six months so presumably it'll be the next meeting before we actually possibly get any information back on what I've asked for which was about stepping up um, to child in need and stepping back down again. Well, can we ask, we don't wait to the next meeting for the answer to that then, for the full answer? It's around what we can what we can meaningfully do with the systems and we're looking at that. So um, I have progressed that again, but if we, you'll appreciate that we change from Care First to Eclipse. So it, it's the mechanics of what we can do um, and, and the value that we get from looking at that analysis. Um, I have picked it up with officers again today. We will have something and share something. It may not expressly be what you've asked for but it will give you the answers to the line of inquiry if that makes sense um so again it isn't a way and we will have it with you shortly thank you thanks Sharon. so any other no okay so we're going to move on to the education and children's social care policy brief um, and i think i hand over to alan who's on screen here um to present this item to the committee uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone on the committee. Um, the policy brief in your pack uh, covers government announcements from the period since you last met until last week. Um, and obviously, there's been some announcements that, that have fo followed that. Uh, so I'll not go through every uh, individual annou announcement, but it might be worth highlighting a few that have actually come out this week. Um, the first relates to uh, funding rule changes affecting SEND tribunal appeals, and both foster parents and approved prospective adoptive parents can apply for means-free legal help and exceptional case funding um, for representation uh, for special educational needs appeals from the 10th of February. Um, and the change applies to appeals heard by the first tier special educational uh, needs and disability tribunal against special educational needs decisions of local authorities. So that was the first one. Um, the second one was uh, the Minister for Women and Equalities has launched a new initiative to help women back into um, STEM-based careers. Um, the scheme, which is backed by uh, funding, um, will be run by women returners and STEM returners, two organisations that have a target to um, uh, th those who have had taken lengthy career breaks um, for, for, for various regions um, to give them the skills they need to um, get to go back into the workplace. And the final one is the um, uh, applications for the Turing scheme are now open. So schools, colleges, universities can apply for um, Turing schemes to fund Turing scheme to fund international study. 
and work opportunities. Um, and this is a government a government program um, where last year over 38,000 people uh, had the chance to to gain those experiences, and more than half of those from last year uh, uh, were were placements for young people from disadvantaged and underrepresented backgrounds. So it's a, a good opportunity for schools to get the application in now. And so that sort of com concludes the policy brief update. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, Councillor Brasdell. Yeah, thank you for the, the policy update. Really useful to keep abreast on, on all of these changes. Um, I just wanted to talk on the point around the maths up to 18 ambition. Um, I, I find this a really interesting one and obviously um, very aware of the, the benefits of, of learning <coughs> maths to a high level. Um, but it was really interesting to see the response from um, teachers unions, particularly the senior staff unions around the, the lack of, of consultation nationally around this. Um, because whether it's deliverable practically, I think, is, is the interesting point. Um, maths A level is already the most popular um, post-16 qualification that's offered. Um, and students who don't get a standard pass in maths GCSE um, are required to retake until the age of 18 already. Um, and so there's a question of whether this devalues the, the GCSE. Um, and on, on a local point of view, my experience working in Plymouth schools is that a lot of maths departments already struggle to staff maths lessons with um, trained maths teachers at the current point. So I was just interested to hear whether anybody in the room genuinely expects in Plymouth um, that there won't be significant challenges on, on the staffing of this um, in practical terms, whether or not we you know, admire the, um, the ambition of the pledge. Annie. Welcome, Annie, to the to the committee. I should have said that, actually. But if you would like to answer this, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would agree with you. Uh, I think that whether you agree or not with every child from 16 to 18 studying maths, we know they all study maths up to the age of 16. The practicalities are a concern. Um, as you pointed out, the recruitment of Specialist maths teachers is challenging. If we talk to our head teachers, they're pleased to get um, one or two applications for any maths role. Um, so, so that's a concern. And it, it depends a little bit on the curriculum. And I think efforts in this area have been made before. But we also know that the pass rate for those young people retaking maths GCSE, who if they've got below a grade four, is something like 25%. It's not a high success rate. Um, so I think it needs careful thinking through in principle and resourcing. Supplementary? Yeah, just very briefly. Yeah, I, I agree with, with all of that. And I can't help but think that practically it'd be much better to invest in helping those students retake than focusing on this interesting percentage of students who haven't chosen maths A level, but also passed their maths GCSE, who aren't necessarily the priority when we still don't have students with basic numeracy. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Puzzle. I'd like to uh, reiterate as an ex-teacher myself uh, what uh, Councillor uh, Brasdell has said uh, and also um, Annie as well. Uh, I wanted to look uh, again coming back to uh, the um, published children's uh, social care implementation and the response to um, Josh McAllister's um, review uh, that came out from the government on what was the 2nd of February, which was very late anyway, and the response that the British Association of Social Workers actually said, and they, they said and described it as being a piecemeal approach. It's one of those things, again, of putting in a sticking plaster and saying that it's not going to be able to tackle the long-standing issues of, for example, the um, high workload, the crisis with the workforce. And without doing those things, it would not be possible to improve the experiences of children and families. And just from the point of view of those, those figures in which the government is saying 200 million being made available from the government against what was actually a 2.6 billion funding over four years, which was recommended from the uh, McAllister report. And I think there's lots that we can certainly put in a, in a reviewed and revised letter that, uh, that, that we send off, because I think this is absolutely crucial if we're really going to change the lives of these young people. We actually have to have some um, real serious long-term investment. 
see if anybody else have anything they want to raise on this. I just wanted to note that um, the new judgment for care leavers um, as part of the ILAX, which I think is a really positive move and certainly, you know, outcomes for care leaves is something we've really majored on here, especially with the help of Mark Riddell and um, our care journeys work. So, um, and I know that this has come from listening to care leavers, um, you know, in part. Um, so um, I just wanted to, to note that I really, really welcome that. And I think um, it's it's an important um, judgment to be added to the, to the list. Um, any other questions or points to raise on this? Or do we, we let Alan go? <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, Alan. Um, so the recommendation Thank you. is for scrutiny to consider the information provided in regard to their role and future agenda items. And I think we have done that. Um, so we're now going to move on to item seven, which is the Ofsted focused visit update and response. And I'm going to hand over to Councillor Carlisle to introduce the report. Thank you, Councillor Carlisle. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you've got in front of you, the re response that we've had, and you've also had the letter, obviously it wasn't comfortable reading with what we had. Um, there's no way we'd ever want any child to be at risk within us at all. I think what we can see when we're reading through from that, though, is that they have accepted there are significant changes that are happening, that there was an awareness as well of the problems. And sometimes with an Ofsted report, when it comes through, it gives you a, a stronger clarity on it. So Sharon has already advised of the improvement needs in the space before the Ofsted visit. Oh, sorry, I've gone really far away there. Sorry about that. Um, and we already have that improvement plan underway. So I'm just going to hand over to Jane now, who's going to talk you through it all as well. Thank you, Jane. Thanks. Sharon, I think you had you expressed yeah. it. So, oh, Prince, okay. got this initially. Apologies, Sharon. Sharon. I thought Sharon's I was going straight to Jane. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I, I, I give a little bit of an overview and then pass over to Jane for the particulars. Um, so, Ofsted were with us on the 14th and 15th of December. Um, it's a two day visit, but actually, um, colleagues, it, it requires it's a two week process really from them letting us know that they're coming to um, us providing a battery of information and then ultimately them arriving a week later to conduct a two day visit. Um, just like to acknowledge and thank our staff. Um, Ofsted inspections, as colleagues know in the room, are um, difficult times for teams, and I'm very proud of the team in, in their way that they conducted themselves, in their openness and honesty in terms of where we were. Um, as Jane and um, already knows, and Charlotte, we, we already had an improvement plan in place, so obviously I joined in June, and having a strong front door is a key component, really, in terms of supporting your social care practice. We knew that there were a number of things that we needed to get right and um, our opening presentation to Ofsted was to say we are working on a number of things and you will find the following. Um, and the real positive thing in, in some respects is what we said you would find, they found, so um, they were able to correlate that into our improvement plan. Um, we talked about the need to have a stronger early help offer in the city and that we were working on that. That offer was actually launched on the 23rd of January, so on the 14th of December we could talk about our plans, but we couldn't yet say it's in place. Um, that was launched on the 23rd of January. It is a pre-book advice line for schools, early year settings, so we, we had had, I had received feedback from the head teachers, early years colleagues and other stakeholders who it's taking too long to get um, support through the gateway process, the early help process. So we've introduced a system which I've used elsewhere, which is a pre-book advice line, no waiting on the end of the telephone, a designated slot. So if you're a teacher in a school, you know when you've got a free lesson, you can ring and you know you're going to have some time to talk something through. More importantly, because we've digitised that, it means that we can understand where the need is and pick up on a picture of need and then understand what we need to do from an intervention prevention point of view. So that has been one of our immediate actions. It was already underway, um, as I've said, launched on the 23rd of January. We had a head teacher briefing just last week um, and we've, we've already had, and I've de definitely had direct conversations with head teachers that have been very positive about that. So more than happy to give an update on that. The two priority areas talk around consent and thresholds. Um, and that's, that's not just around the local authority, it's also about our partners understanding and, and seeking consent. So um, within the local authority, we have conducted a number of areas of review to make sure the thresholds and consent within our local authority team is right. Um, but we're also holding, first time in a few years, a citywide event on the 26th of April. The invitation went out last week 
to all practitioners to talk about early help, building support, consents and thresholds. I think sometimes through the COVID period, the changes in staff, that we're perhaps there's been a drop in communication. So as a, a proactive matter, we will get uh, lots of colleagues in the room, in a uh, physical room on the 26th of April to talk about consents and thresholds and make sure we get the calibration of that right. Around consents and thresholds in the actual match, we have introduced a uh, fortnightly meeting, which is probably likely to move to a monthly meeting, where we're looking at those um, incidents of no further action or re-referral into the MASH. And we will do that with police colleagues, health colleagues, education colleagues, and look at what we did, what decisions did we make, and how do we learn. So we're really improving our quality assurance cycle. I'm sure Jane can provide some more detail on that. The other area in the report you'll notice is around uh, police out of hours response and we're working with police colleagues on that at a partnership level. We are meeting every six weeks at a strategic level to make sure that we've got the right grip and control. The other priority area action was around our use and application strategy discussions and again we are looking at the what, the when and the why and making sure that we make those improvements and that Jane can pick up on the particulars. I hope you'd note that there are some positive narratives there around the new leadership team in place and the direction of travel. Um, we will continue to improve in this space. Um, we have, the letter talks about the fact that I had asked for some additional resource to make improvements. Colleagues had literally arrived a couple of weeks before Ofsted arrived, so it was difficult to demonstrate the progress, but we were absolutely able to say, we know what the issues are and we are working to it. Um, we are a number of weeks down the line now, eight weeks down the line. Jane has a um, service improvement board, um, which we've, we've waited for the changes to embed a little, and that starts next week, and that's where we will absolutely be holding each of the accounts. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that the letter is the way it is, um, but I'm very confident that we will make the changes we need to make. And again, I'd just like to acknowledge my officers and, and those in the partnership that have worked really well. Please... Um, take a time to go on Facebook and look at our really help offer. I'm really proud of it and I think it will really help us support the needs of our families sooner. And then just finally, with the addition of Annie in the team now, we're really thinking about that protective role of education and making sure that's working really, really well in the MASH space. Um, so Annie will be supporting us in that space. Um, so I will now pass it to Jane. Jane, perhaps you just talk about the two particular priority actions and what we've done and then happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sharon. So, yeah, so you'll, you'll see in the letter that there are two um, areas for priority action and we'll be providing a response back to the DfE and, sorry, to Ofsted around um, our action plan and how we know we're making a difference in those two particular areas um, later on this month. In relation to the first um, area, and Sharon's covered some of that ground and I'll add a bit more detail in, around consistent understanding and application of thresholds. So the other elements that I'd add to that in terms of your assurance of grip and oversight and controls within the sort of MASH setting particularly um, are the addition of, so an additional team manager and an improvement manager to really support understanding and development within that service and also um, from a kind of technical point of view to ensure that the decisions that are being made there um, have both um, an experienced decision maker and also quality assurance team management oversight. So that additional capacity um, makes a tangible difference to the double, what we might refer to as double decision making, so extra quality assurance check at that level. Um, additionally, it provides capacity for team managers to chair strategy meetings, so back to that um, second area of priority action, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, Sharon's talked about the operational um, MASH group uh, in terms of additional quality assurance, and I will be, as Sharon's described, chairing the front door improvement board from next week um, to assure alignment with our priority action plan, our front door improvement plan, and how that fits with our overarching whole system, whole service improvement plan, which we're just finalising now <clears throat> to make sure we've got our key metrics there. We've really got grip and control of our pace and the quality of our work um, and that we can demonstrate that in tangible ways in terms of progress um, towards our targets and goals. In terms of the second priority actions, there's two kind of strands to that, both around convening and timeliness of critical uh, safeguarding um, functions, one strategy meetings, and also initial child protection conferences. Um, in terms of uh, strategy discussions, 
again, that additional team management capacity and the changes that we've made to systems around um, accountability and oversight of those strategy meetings with additional team managers, um, that's a very real and um, tangible change in terms of increasing the accountability and the quality of decision making, having confidence in that decision making, tested by the operational group. In terms of ICPCs, we've had a particular um, um, moment in time around oversight and quality, and that's partly related to some gaps in um, role cover in our conferencing service. Um, we've got, we've had to start with us recently an extremely experienced and competent service manager in that space, and I've worked closely, and Sharon has also with him, around understanding the changes that are needed there. Um, and we've seen um, an, an exceptional increase in performance from a concerning low base to a very good standard of ICPC timeliness um, uh, uh, up to and including today, so my checking of the report today. So we're confident we've got grip in that area. I'll just stop there in case there are any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so over to questions then. So we've got Councillor Harrison, Councillor Croswell, Councillor Beer and Councillor Riley. Starting with you, Councillor Harrison. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that report. Uh, you said that there's going to be a, a, an improvement manager. Has this been costed in as far? Obviously, we've got budget considerations at the moment. If this is a new post, is that being added into the budget? Yeah. Um, in September, I went to a corporate management team saying we have a number of improvement needs within children's services and there are some designated areas where I wanted improvement to take place in September. That amount was agreed in September and is part of the transformation bid, so had already been agreed and was already part of our improvement <coughs> programme. Councillor Beer. Thank you, Chair. Um, being that I've just refreshed myself on this um, Ofsted report, I was a bit alarmed to once again be sat here talking about our early help offer. We've been talking about that since 2007 when I first became a councillor. Um, so I'm hoping that we get it right this time and we don't repeatedly have to discuss it at this scrutiny. But I also feel that we should be monitoring it at this scrutiny panel. Can you tell me, please, what part of uh, the early help offer would children's centres have? Um, <clears throat> I think the answer to that is an integral one. Um, and the, er the early help offer isn't obviously just the local authority, it's the whole of the system in the city supporting our children. Um, so we, we will have a family hub programme of work um, and really identifying the role of our children's centres, the offer they have. But to your point, uh, Councillor Beer, really understanding our data and need and understanding what's happened before, what has worked and what hasn't. I think the system is quite fragmented and that was certainly my assessment being new to the city in um, the first six months. So it isn't just a local authority thing, it's a system wide. I think we have some assets that we need to do more and make better of. Um, I also think um, it's absolutely about relationships and really integrating what we know about our communities and how best we serve them, and particularly thinking around the role of children's centres and voluntary and community organisations, and indeed our early years offer, in really making sure that we support our little ones in, into their education as early as we can. So there is a family hub programme, which is um, combining that offer, and we, are, we have um, we're very fortunate in having that additional investment monies, and we have a number of colleagues that have joined us um, we have an early years board where that will be, um, at the moment, the governance will be through that. Um, but we will absolutely be looking at actually what does the Children's so uh, Centre programme need to bring, but also um, not forgetting our um, SEND cohort in this space as well and our support for them to 0 to 25. In, in terms of data, um, I think we... The, the process that we're going through, discussions we're having internally at the moment, is having one system and one place of capturing that so we can understand need across the system. The early help we've got online gives us some of that, but also when we actively engage, having a system-wide approach to that. So we will be looking at some um, developments in our IT space um, to make sure we've absolutely got a tracking and thinking about methodologies and tools used to, to understand the distance travelled for families know when it's worked well and think about how we use that going forward so more to do um, it is my hope that we do it once and well now that's something I talk about often that we don't um, underestimate what we know from the past and that we learn from what we've tried before as well 
Um, just want to add to that, Sharon. Um, my concern would be that um, obviously the offers we, we help in different areas across the city may differ um, due to uh, a variety of restraints out there. Um, so will we be having that built-in flexibility to be able to adjust to serve those communities in the way that they deserve to be served? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Creswell. I've got a couple of questions, but the first one is actually directly to you, um, Councillor Carlisle. Were you surprised by the, um, by the findings? Um, no, I wasn't. Um, myself, I've been speaking to the management team with Sharon and we knew where the weaknesses were and I knew that the plan was already in place. So it wasn't, uh, it's, it's horrible to see it in black and white, but it wasn't a surprise. And I knew that stuff was already in place to sort of look after it. That's good. That's, that's very good. That's always a, a good start. Um, the thing I wanted to particularly uh, focus on, and one of the things that came up and sort of, uh, and I noticed, was it says about an, an, um, a lack of an open and learning culture, which mm. I think is absolutely key and fundamental within mm. any organisation. Um, it's encouraging to see that um, with the uh, change of leadership and such, and the uh, and the work that's been put in place so far, that there is actually a, a change that's going on there. But it does actually say that the pace of change is quite slow. Mm. I wanted to bring it round particularly about this um, this. Uh, <laughs> this um, culture, this openness, learning culture and such, because it also comes into something that's le mentioned later on about the difficulties there are in terms of training difficulties, mainly because, of course, there is a lot of workload and uh, that means that it's very difficult for um, staff to actually access that training. And training and um, important professional development is vital in uh, any kind of... Um, any kind of profession and what we want to do is we want to actually increase that pace of change but eventually you want to make sure that that change is going to actually be thoroughly embedded and is secure and I wondered what was being done in order to perhaps improve those um, against what's obviously quite difficult those um, learning opportunities to improve that sort of um, cultural openness. Okay. Um, in terms of pace and change, just to put that into context, Ofsted will be looking at the previous inspection report. So in 2019, it talked about a need for a quality assurance system. So I think some of that is, is, is the context, the pace of change. Um, in terms of culture, um, I think we all know this, that <coughs> if we don't get the culture right, you can have the best plan and the best strategy, but you, you know it's, it will eat, eat the plan for breakfast every time. I think that's a fam famous quote, isn't it? So I've worked really hard and we have worked really hard as a leadership team um, to make sure we set the right culture. And I am a massive proponent of a learning organisation and an honest conversation. I opened this session saying I was proud of my staff in their openness and honesty. I think, you know, colleagues in the room will have experiences where people pretend it's something other than it is. We start off with we know how it is for our children and we make it better each and every day. The learning culture is something that I'm absolutely wedded to. In my first uh, 12 weeks here, as you know, colleagues, I, I conducted the diagnostic, which resulted in the improvement plan and the request for additional monies. It was clear to me that we had a number of um, areas that we needed to support our staff on, and we have put in a number of um, regular incidents and events where we can speak with staff so every six weeks and um, we meet the whole of the service now um, and there's some set pieces for myself Jane and Annie um, and then there's some active learning sets and we will continue to do that it's very well attended very good feedback achieved we've introduced a star of the week's award where colleagues in the service get to nominate each other for good and outstanding practice and that's generating um, very positive activity. To date, we've had around 140 stars allocated since it launched on October the 14th. Um, I'm in the building walking and saying hello to people three times a week and um, having active conversations, creating that environment when it's okay to say how it is. Um, from a CPD point of view and a workforce development point of view and from a workload point of view, part of that diagnostic is understanding our system and looking at caseloads and looking at the complexity in that. We are moving towards a new target operating model and we will absolutely be re redesigning some of our, our services. Moreover, and more importantly, we can see in our system we have a structure that creates lots of handovers for children. If you think you're a mum or a child, it means you're going to have to say your thing again and again. Uh, we will move away from that into locality structures. 
that will take some of our throughput out of the system because instead of stepping up and stepping down, you'll maintain in the service and be supported by a locality team. So the final um, part of that is the right structure to support practice, um, getting the caseloads to an optimum level, and we have an item on recruitment and retention which we can pick up, which again is evidence of progress. Um, but we also need to make sure that we have a very clear workforce offer. So Jane and colleagues have worked very hard in making sure we get the generic offer right, um, but that we also have specialist aspects to it because supporting, for example, a foster a social worker in the fostering service will be different from supporting a social worker in the MASH and again to our child protection space. So we have introduced a number of generic practice leadership workshops, but then we will have very tailored programmes um, for our workforce. One of my um, intentions and now realities is that we've also reduced the offer because we had an awful lot and it was almost pick and choose what you want. And actually what we need to do is make it very prescriptive, get the basics right, get the foundations right and then accelerate to the next level. So hopefully um, that's answered your questions, but they are all connected into a target operating model that looks at how we best support our children. And staff are positive, staff have been involved in those co-production events. I'll just come back with one thing. I'll come back with a positive because it's always important to finish on a positive to teach with me. Um, is that what I ticked here is the determination, enthusiasm and visibility of the newly appointed senior leadership team are much welcomed by staff. And I can't stress and, you know, how important those work relationships, leadership, leadership by example is, I think, absolutely crucial to um, any successful team in whether you're in school or, or, or whatever it might be. So I wanted to finish on a real positive. Councillor Carla. Um, just, I'd just like to, um, thanks Chair, I'd just like to back up what Sharon was saying as well. So Sharon does uh, question and answer sessions um, every month and I sort of sit on, on those and I think that people are talking much more openly and honestly in those and it's really nice to see that they've got that co confidence and courage in front of peers and the directors to actually ask those questions and know that they're going to be answered. Um, I also did a surprise visit to the recent Ballard House, the new offices there, and uh, with no management, no warning, just I sort of popped in and said hello and uh, chatted to everyone and they were really happy. They were happy with the new offices, they were happy with how they were working and I do ask them about management, I do ask them, you know, how's they feeling and, and all of it has been so much more positive. The changes, certainly in the last, or I would say the last two to three months, what I'm hearing now to what I was perhaps hearing before. I've never heard anything really bad. Let's, I'm not going down that way, but what I've heard in the last two to three months has been good, positive changes and people reinforcing what Sharon, Jane and Annie have been saying. So obviously it is feeding through and it's now starting to come back, which is really good to hear. Thank you, Councillor Carlisle. Uh, Councillor Brasdell. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your frankness today. You know, it must have been a really difficult time. Um, and, you know, clearly a lot of work has, has gone into the, the response to it. Um, the end of the letter specifies that um, within 70 working days, um, an action plan needs to be submitted to Ofsted um, and that a early draft, um, if possible, within 20 working days of receiving the letter. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, you know, because there, there must have been issues with transparency for there to be any um, doubt or question mark around the extent of this issue so to, to reassure the committee um, I was just wondering whether you think it's feasible for all of the scrutiny members on this committee to receive a copy of that when it is sent yeah I mean we're working on it at the moment um, and the transparency is key so happy to share that when it's appropriate once it's gone through those structures no. Councillor Raleigh. I have a couple of questions, please. Um, firstly, the front door issues with regards to domestic abuse service. Um, I have used this service both with a client and on a personal level. And it's clunky to say the least, and it's a little bit a little bit cold, I would I would suggest. Um, so going forward, what is you know what is on the table for that because we're going to move over aren't we into Ballard so how 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 are we going to address that for for service users because the the particular client I had with me was a care leaver um and I don't believe she you know she returned because her particular worker was off sick which can't be helped can't be helped at all but there's no staff and so there was no one brought in on her on her behalf so we we were kind of taken away and she became our kind of 
responsibility for us to take care of as a, as a homeless care leaver. So I was just wondering how moving forward we're going to deal with that. I do have another question. Shall I wait? <laughs> Aim, would you like to pick up the domestic abuse response? Yeah, thank you. So a, a few things to say. Um, I think we'd all share that um, the seriousness of the comments that are in that letter, absolutely around that area. Um, we've immediately moved. In fact, we had it slightly in train, but we, we've now um, completed a review of our domestic abuse training across the, across the service, a professional development offer. We've revised it, refreshed it, and there's a new schedule of training and the toolkit to support um, the right knowledge and skills being available to um, often, yeah, so let's say um, um, victims of um, violence and abuse. Um, that is in motion now. In terms of the front door, there's a couple of elements to that. So what, one of the um, measures that needed to improve was around triage, so that immediate response. We know from evidence and research that first 24 hours is crucial in terms of the right response. Um, so we've, again, through that additional team management capacity, increased our triage response to an immediate rag rating response um, at the front door. But also, um, we have a commission service in Plymouth. It's a very good commission service. We need to think together about um, how we might maximise that. And I've begun some conversations, which at another time we can update on, and there's a review currently underway, how we can better use and get better value um, and then more immediate response provision through that commissioned arrangement and through our partnerships with them. Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough on that, if that's okay. Have you got another question? I, I do, yeah. Uh, so the out police out of hours is a bit of a concern. Um, mm. And well, I respect, obviously, that, you know, you saw this and you, you're, you're move, you know, looking at things to improve it. But I just wanted to know, uh, you said that you're having six meetings every six weeks. But what is in what? What's the meat of those meetings? What What's the out? What What's the projected outcome? What do you want to achieve with it? And 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 also, and I don't mean to be in any way rude at all, but positivity is absolutely fantastic, and we we all need to, you know, it's a difficult job. But are we reflecting on the things that we've not done okay? Also, yeah. shall I take that in reverse order? <laughs> so reflecting on. Um, what we haven't done as well as perhaps we should is really, really important. And the best way to understand that is to talk to children and families and then talk to staff. Because sometimes things get filtered, don't, don't they? So that, that our leadership approach is let's go and listen and ask the open question and really understand what's happening, not what we think is happening, what's really been told to us, and really hear that. So um, we have and I will and we will continue to listen to what our children and families say and our staff say. I, I look at each and every complaint that comes in through to say, so what do we need to do differently? What is this telling us about our system? Back to the Stronger System Leadership Board every six weeks. I'll just flip that a little bit. So at the, currently, every fortnight, police, education, health and MASH colleagues are getting together to look at how well are we doing. One of those meetings happened yesterday. Um, we were looking, and so we have police colleagues in the room, education colleagues, health colleagues. Um, we are looking at operational practice week in, week out. Um, so from that meeting yesterday, we've identified some issues. There is an action plan to look and understand. And then the findings of what we know and what we're doing about it are fed up to that strategic group the every six weeks. And that's the place where we as partners would hold each other to account. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you know, to make it up now, if the police were not happy with our response at a strategic level, it gets up to that position. We have a discussion, we do something about it. So we've absolutely got a closed loop system around it. So each and every week. So yesterday we met and um, agreed it needs to be weekly at the moment to make sure we get the grip that we need to get. Um, there, we are looking at things that we want to explore from a learning perspective. How do we do this better? Actions are set. They meet in a week. If we're seeing a continuation, things aren't improving or at the pace that is appropriate and sustainable, then it would be escalated through to that st stronger system leaderships board, which is where your strategic leaders meet. So it really gives a closed loop environment. The every six weeks is important because it's important that you give the actioners time to embed and change, otherwise you can jump too soon. Um, and that leadership board used to meet every 12 weeks. Since December, we've pulled it forward to every six weeks to make sure that we've got that grip. So hopefully that gives you that answer. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions, then Councillor Harrison and then Councillor Pe Pengeli. Um, it's co I, I'm coming in now because it's kind of what you've just been talking about, about um, the system and, and application of thresholds and all those things. And I've said, obviously, are looking at us, but this is a partnership matter and doing this properly in means our partners have to be on board. So um, I, I get that you're having the fortnightly <clears throat> meetings, but how can you assure us that you know, because it's very concerning to read that, um, you know, meetings are delayed because of police availability, etc. Mm -hmm. That has a knock-on effect that, that uh, one of our children might be at risk of harm because of that. Um, just so how can you assure us that police, health, education are all on board? And how are you disseminating the idea of thresholds? Because, again, it's not just for us to understand thresholds. It's all our partners as well. Very quick answer, I'll pass over to Jane. Um, so oversight, oversight, oversight is the, that's how we know. Um, in, in terms of how we do it, um, we want to move away and in spreading the understanding around thresholds as the building support document, which I'll let Jane talk about. But our process change will be instead of partners filling in forms, they'll be calling in and having a conversation. That conversation allows for a calibration of actually this isn't quite yet at a safeguarding issue, or actually this is an early help discussion that could happen in this space. Um, historically, our MASH environment is predominantly fill in a form and then get a response. Um, that doesn't really work, and listening to teachers and practitioners, they say, and just literally the session we had yesterday with practitioners in that space saying, when we get to taking the form away and having a conversation, that enables a real learning and dialogue in the partnership. But I'll pass over to Jane just around any, any particulars you want to answer to that. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, so the, so the building support document is a partnership document and it is really intended to ensure that we have the right response at the right time and that we're not, we're not working to artificial processes and cliff edges that make it difficult for children and families to access the right support that they need. So I think the feedback from some of the lettering and diagnostic work we've done is we need to do more to embed that and to make sure that across our uh, schools and across our early years settings, the health, edu edu um, police, etc., that is fully understood throughout the workforce. And so the, the event that Sharon referred to is going to be important plank in that. So is our engagement and our increasing um, work in the partnership space. Um, and there's also been a great deal of work at the front door, the early help advice line, etc. So multiple touch points and through all those touch points, reinforcing and strengthening our understanding of thresholds and our understanding of consent within that in terms of rights of children and families to make choices about accessing services. Thank you. Because it's just the, the burden of a letter like this, a shocking letter like this, shouldn't just fall on the local authority. The, the children safety and safeguarding and all the rest of it is a shared a responsibility across the city and I've just got two very quick things just how will you judge the effectiveness uh, effectiveness of the phone line what are the kind of KPIs around that and how will you report that back to us and kind of follow on from what Tom said around how will you report back to the committee on the action plan and how that's progressing thank you okay um, so <clears throat> when we introduce the phone line and um, we'll have a system where um, we, we can record this is used you know, up and down the country you record the conversations you can use those in live supervision then to to support colleagues um, I would also expect a system where if you have a, um, a conversation that you, you know, wave your hand and somebody will the supervisor will help have that conversation with you so that from from a on the ground practically for our staff and for our stakeholders there will be a live um, transcript of those calls to support and enable and supervise where we need to in terms of how do we know it's working i think we'll probably come back to the number of referrals into the mash the number of re repeat referrals and sometimes repeat rep referrals are appropriate because things have changed and there's a different decision to be made so there will be key metrics that um, i'm sure jane can talk through in terms of how we would from a numbers point of view measure actually is this having a difference crudely what i would like to see in our system um, is more early help activity and the numbers of referrals reducing um, because if we do do things earlier um, hopefully you prevent there always be as we know incidents where it needs to come through but crudely for me as a system and as a city I would want to see the early help population of support going up and um, and again that would link to our family help hubs and children centre programs um, and the number of safeguarding referrals diminishing and where they are a um, absolute response to them 
that's saying yes we, we are supporting the working together um, guidelines and that we're meeting the needs of our children. Did you want to add anything Jane? Um, just, just to say Council Carl, I think um, so the um, structure that we've taken, the approach that we've taken to the wider overarching and also next level down plans, including the priority action plan, will be to have performance indicators built into it. So it's very, very clear. It's, it's a, it's of course gives us that quantitative, that data measure, and behind that we do need to make sure that we're also doing the qualitative work and understanding from feedback from families, from our communities, um, and also from our staff and other users and stakeholders what the quality of their experience from us are, but there are some really important metrics in there which will be um, certainly available for us to report onto this forum going forward. I'll just come back, Sharon. Yeah, just in terms of the overall plan, there will be a plan and then there will be, um, through our quality assurance arrangements, um, working together 2018, we will have um, set points where we will produce a response in terms of the evidence of the progress of the plan and to reassure colleagues that will both be in terms of what I would describe as the count measures, but also the auditing activity that gives you the, the, the insight into the lived experience of our children and the feedback. So Jenny and I are working on that at the moment, but there will be a governance structure. And when the time's right, we can bring that back here to share progress against that plan. Thank you. Councillor Harrison. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, moving um, on with the, the early help side of things. Uh, you said there's going to be a booked system for the early help for practitioners, teachers to be able to contact. Uh, what idea have you got in terms of how far in advance they need to book? You know, if we think about things like GP surgeries, you know, you might have to wait two months before you get an appointment. So, you know, and, and, and by which time actually the early help will turn into something perhaps more serious. And alongside that, is there scope? bearing in mind you've got book a uh, book system that actually if somebody does need to speak to somebody there is flexibility in the system for for somebody to be able to call you know a uh, sort of a, a time when anybody can call it's just a, a, a free line to, to call in case you have got a query so the system is live now um, and we have a tracking system um, it is our contention that most early help can be managed in a pre-booked session um, if you if you make it a, it's trying to make the best available use of the resource that we've got and the feedback from our heads they're happy with that because their frustration was when they are free they're waiting to get through on a phone line this way you are booking in advance and you know when you're going to be free so um, we at the moment that is working and working well in terms of capacity we have redirected resource to that we um, through Jane's team, we'll have a monthly report and a weekly report looking at volume and pre-booking. At the moment, we are meeting the requirements. If that increases, um, and again, through the data, it, we might need to understand why. So, for example, if there is a school that perhaps has a particular need around a particular cohort of children, then there might be a way that a visit and a, a more detailed time and looking at what's going on in that school, if it's perhaps around inclusion, support, etc., so um, at the moment, there is no waiting time. Um, we have put dedicated resource to it. We will continue to monitor it. And if we see there are settings that need more time, then we'll think about how best we do that. I think really importantly to note, this isn't just about um, social care per se. It's also about understanding how we support our vulnerable learners um, and how we make best use of our SEND colleagues, our education welfare officers. So really thinking about the whole system response to a school. So no waiting list at the moment, we are looking at the information. And I suppose for us thinking about getting to that good and outstanding place, when we get to more early help, if that means that we need to shift from a social care resource, that we do that and calibrate that. Um, and, and from a workforce point of view, obviously that's a more efficient use of spend and we could have more in that space than in the social work <coughs> space. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pangeli. Thank you, Chair. Um, when you read the report, there are a lot of paragraphs there that say that actually say much work is needed to be done. Um, but fortunately, there are a couple that are good. It says since the last inspection, the local authority has strengthened its process in response to children at risk of criminal and sexual exploitation. Then over the page it says staff report that senior leaders are exceptionally visible and that there is much improved work culture. But those are comments I'd like to make. But my question is to the um, officers and the cabinet member, do you feel you have the confidence that you have the staff 
and the resources that's going to change all these paragraphs into something like those two that are good? Because if not... <laughs> so we have a recruitment retention item, which is at the next, which is a key enabler for that. Um, and, and linking back to the McAllister review, social work capacity is an issue up and down the country. Um, we um, need to have more permanent social workers in Plymouth to provide the stability that we need, but we are looking at the systemic reasons behind that, and we have a paper to talk about the difference we need to make there. Um, equally, if we get a system that is uh, performing better and supporting some of the activity in the system that we've got on the repeat activity wouldn't be in place, so it's stabilising the system. Um, so at the moment, I think we have the plans that we have and we need to make the progress and see where that takes us. Um, if, if, if we could find more permanent social workers into our system straight away tomorrow, that would obviously help. But that is an issue up and down the country, um, but one that we hope our recruitment and retention strategy will address. Jane, I don't know if you want to add anything or any. No, I think so. Uh, only, only to say, I think the right conversations have taken place, and I, I'll certainly say um, that I think corporately we feel well supported in the improvement, and there is no shortage of realism about the amount of work that need, that's needed to be done. Um, um, however, there is a real sense of collective uh, purpose and focus and unity around that. So, yeah, and we'll come to the recruitment and retention things in a minute. Okay. I don't think we've got any other questions. So, um, the Sorry, I was, I was oh, literally just going to re it's okay, oh. Chair. I was also reiterate what, what Sharon said. We are part of a national trend, but we've hopefully identified certainly in the next paper what's happening uh, like locally that we can change in our staff. That'd be the great. Thank you. So the recommendation is to note the report, and I would just say, you know, just to reiterate, I, I found that devastating to read that letter, and I welcome the frankness and the transparency about what we're going to do about it. And I'm sure I can speak for the whole committee as committee members and councillors, we'll do anything we can to support this work and to send that message back to your staff and your teams that we're absolutely behind. We have to get this right for children. Reading things about our children in Plymouth being at risk of harm is just, we, we can't have another letter like that again. So I know that we would all do whatever um, you need us to do to support the work that needs to happen in, in that um, action plan. So thank you for that. So now we're going to move on to item eight, which is the re recruitment and retention update. And I'm going to hand over to Councillor Carlisle to introduce the report. Thank you, Chair. So this report sets out the five priorities to improve recruitment and retention. We're looking at the right culture and the conditions. We are also looking at an all-inclusive culture for practice, um, an enhanced career pathway to grow and retain our own as well, and a competitive approach to recruitment and retention, especially in uh, the current day market. And we need to invest in services through an efficient uh, target operating model as well. So I'm going to pass over to Sharon. <laughs> Let me double check that one because I got it wrong last time. I'll pass over to Sharon to fill in. Um, I'm actually going to pass over to Jane. <laughs> But, but um, only because like, you've probably heard me talk enough now, and, and Jane needs to take credit for the work that she's done in this phase. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, so um, I think colleagues will probably remember that we've, we've previously um, reported to this committee on this matter, and I know people will be concerned to ensure that we are taking the right steps to ensure that we have a stable workforce and can deliver um, the improvements associated with that, both both for children, young people and families, and also for the well-being of um, our staff. Um, so as Councillor Carlisle has described, we did previously update that our strategy, which we expect to be um, approved on the 1st of March, before the 1st of March, um, sets out five priorities, and that's based on some comprehensive review um, work, both internally and internationally, that was undertaken last year, and really aligned with um, the findings from the McAllister Review. Um, I'll just speak to a few of the tangible um, updates from last um, time. I think that will probably be most pressing and, and relevant for people um, and leave time for questions. So um, we have talked um, already this morning about some of the measures that are set out in this report and particularly around our team management development and the development of our professional, develop, um, professional development offer. It's not development. Um, um, that's fundamentally important, but as is creating the right conditions in terms of capacity of social workers to really do that direct work with families that they need to do and want to do. 
So we are um, developing and exploring a new assistant social work role that will address some of the uh, administrative um, requirements of the role that are set out in the review and also our own local review. Um, and a, a retention incentive, which I know has been discussed um, here previously. We've looked very carefully at the regional and national market around that in terms of our competitive position. Um, and we've set out what we believe to be the right response that will give us the right return on investment in the longer term in terms of um, securing our um, valued staff. We also have, um, as, uh, by way of an update from last time, um, continued in our progress for recruitment of international social workers. We have got 16 um, very experienced social workers um, joining us, nine in March and the, and the remaining in May. And they will um, um, predominantly move into the permanent service, which um, colleagues may recall we have established an additional team in and our exit plan from that interim team has always been the recruitment of international social workers. Positive to see that achieved uh, or in the process of achievement and the others into our central children's social workspace. In terms of that inclusive culture, again, we've spoken to some of this already, um, and we've established new forums and new ways of ensuring that um, our practice colleagues across the service um, are included and are influencing the shape of our work, including our retention and um, recruitment activities. Um, so those um, forums have begun, they take place monthly, they're very well attended across the service, um, and we're driving some vitally important insights from that, um, as well as some great ideas around innovation, of course. Um, we talked about professional development offer. We are expanding the scope and of the existing academy to be really a children's academy that speaks to a wider professional development need across the city um, and across our service um, that develops those um, core and differentiated offers that Sharon spoke to. Um, that are congruent with our improvement focus and our improvement priorities. Um, and that will be in place by the end of March. Um, and uh, our early career framework, so there's um, very clear evidence around the um, exit points for um, our early years, newly qualified social workers within the first three years of qualifying. We really need to stem that tide and to hold those um, good new social workers in our service and our early career framework as an early response to what is set out in the review. So um, protected, some protected elements in that, some additional support, supervision and um, professional development. Um, we are considering other incentives. This is a work in progress, so we're uh, currently focused on delivering the elements of this recruitment and retention strategy that are going to deliver the most significant impacts and benefits for us. There are a range of other issues that we'll be looking at in terms of some of the um, proposals and discussions that have been held here before around the incentives for refer a friend, um, for example. Um, our social work professional registration fees. Um, and crucially, um, we are through our targeted operating model development, creating the right commercial roles and focus within the organisation that are going to really help us drive this work in what is a very competitive market. Um, and we will have a series of performance measures and scorecards that demonstrate our progress in this area, some of which, uh, such as caseloads and vacancy rates we have now, others that we need to um, build in and take forward around um, for example, demonstrating the impact that's having in the reduction of agency social workers and agency spend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do, and do people have questions? Sorry, sorry. So, Councillor Creswell and then Councillor Beer. Um, I was just quite interested, um, Jane, particularly in the, um, the new role of assistant social worker. I actually thought that there were assistant social workers uh, anyway, a bit like... Um, uh, HLTAs in, uh, in, in school, high learning, uh, high level teaching assistants. And, and because that is a way of, um, uh, of them taking on some of the, some of the, as you say, admin responsibility and some of the, those other responsibilities. And, and as I'm assuming here, the intention would be that some of them would then move on to training where they could be actually, um, place-based and do the necessary academic training in order to uh, become qualified social workers and ideally then hold them with, 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 within the um, authority. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we, so we currently have family support workers and, and, and other alternatively qualified roles throughout the service. Um, but this, this is a role that's been very thoughtfully developed to respond to what our staff are telling us um, are some of the challenges and barriers to their um, 
availability to work directly with children. So that is um, some of that's around supportive work with families and some of that's around um, managing some of the bureaucratic um, requirements of the role. So, um, yeah, specific to that. Could I just ask a follow up? How many, um, how, how many uh, assistant social workers are you planning or hoping to be able to actually take on and start recruiting? Um, so we, we're finalising that at the moment. Our um, current focus based on our um, vacancy pressures, as, as you will know, is in the centre part of the service. So we need to focus our efforts in that space at the moment um, and then look at the whole piece in terms of what's needed across. Okay. Councillor Beer. Um, some years ago, we used to have a scheme at Plymouth City Council where we linked in with the university. Um, so social workers training at university level were able to come over to Plymouth City Council and do um, like a job placement uh, scheme. Are we still running that? Because that would be an opportunity to actually get people who've come to Plymouth University to train as social workers and to keep them within our city. You. So we, we do have a range of schemes and, and particularly successfully for us has been the postgraduate traineeship through the university. Um, there's more that we can do in that space though and we need to develop our apprenticeships offer and speaking to the point um, um, that you um, that we were just um, raising there around uh, recruitment pathways. That's going to be a fundamental um, element of that that we need to get right. So it, it, it looks likely that that would be through an apprenticeship, a, a degree apprenticeship route through the university. Sharon and I are meeting with colleagues at the university in March um, to really cement those relationships and to begin speaking about how we co-collaborate on the development of that. So uh, just an observation really, so it sounds like we've had a bit of a breakdown from the scheme that we set up in 2017 when I was a cabinet member um, and it's perhaps lapsed a little bit and you're now resurrecting it which is a good thing um, and I think that linking with the university is on target thank you um, I'm just going to ask a quick question and then Councillor Tippett I was just wondering about the um, the social workers coming um, from overseas just what the kind of pastoral packages for them because obviously it's a big deal to move country move job all the rest of it um to make that transition as smooth as possible and to make hopefully that they will stay here as long as possible yeah so absolutely and two, two elements to that or maybe maybe three briefly so one we've we've partnered with a very experienced um, recruitment agency that we've done some um significant due diligence around in terms of their their success with other um, local authorities um, so they, as part of that work, deliver a significant amount of the planning and support post um, their arrival in the UK, and that will be ongoing for the first year. Um, we've had, as, as colleagues will know, some very um, success, uh, some high success in this area. Previously, predates me, but some of those colleagues are still in our service, and we've obviously, um, of course, connected with them in terms of what's worked for them, what found, what was a challenge for them, and really making sure that we've done the learning and we've got the right things in place. Um, for that pastoral support as you've described. Um, there is also um, a very substantial and tailored induction programme for them professionally and personally that crosses both those elements. Um, and yeah, so certainly I can share more details on that another time if that'd be helpful, but there's a significant um, sure. programme we had. Just to add to that, obviously we're working with the hospitals in, in Plymouth as well that also have that international social uh, international recruitment programmes so that we get the communities and peer building together. I mean, I don't know as a suggestion, um, I'm just thinking of how the kind of receptions have worked for um, members of the, the Ukraine task force that I don't know if there's something you could put in where members of this committee could go and have a cup of tea with them just to make it really clear to them how welcome they are and how how glad we are that they're here. I don't know if it would disrupt your induction programme, but certainly I'd be happy to do it, and I'm sure other members of the committee would be happy to do it yeah. too. Um, so Councillor Tippett and then Councillor Bengeli. Yeah, I'd definitely be happy to join you on the having the cup of tea thing. And also, I just, mine's not a question. Uh, I need to declare an item, a uh, declaration of personal interest under item eight. The University of Plymouth was mentioned, and I wasn't anticipating that, and that's a personal interest. Thank you. Councillor Bengeli.
Georgie's microphone. Yeah, so nine are due to join us in March and the remainder in May. It's one extra as well. We're only anticipating 15. We've got an extra, so it's good. Great. So I don't think there's any further questions on this. Thank you very much for the update. The recommendation is that we note the report and... Um, Yes, good luck to everybody joining us before too long. Um, so now um, we're going to move on to the performance scorecard. So can I hand over to Councillor Carlisle, um, who is going to introduce this item? And then I suspect, Paul, is it is it you who's going to be speaking? So thank you, Councillor Carlisle. Thank you, Chair. Um, so with the performance scorecard that you've got in front of you, I have regular first sessions with Jane to advise me of any change in the system. Also get reports from Paul as well. We need to continue our focus on improving our understanding regarding referral uh, levels and to focus on NEAT in our care leavers because we spoke about that before here as well and address also the attendance and the absenteeism issue in the city which is something that we've addressed before. So Jane and Annie are going to be responding to these. Um, we're looking at school attainment as well, good to see progress for some of our children. Um, we've got united and clear focus on this who are not regularly accessing education and I know we've brought this up before with like our care leavers in corporate parenting because we don't want their attainment um, we want their attainment to continue because we don't want them to fall behind and early years I'll sort of well, I'm going to pass on to that because I think that's going to be something that Jane will carry but we are looking we've got quality and standards are as good in the city and the team are working very hard to support them so if I pass over to Jane she can probably go in a bit more in depth and then Paul can delve even more. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. I don't have any specific questions on that. If you're just happy for Paul to pick up. I just wondered, Paul, if you can kind of draw attention to what you think is well, the most... Yeah, so um, obviously you've seen this report a number of times. So obviously there's some new councillors that have joined us, so this might be new to you. Um, we've done this for uh, three or four quarters now, and it seems to be working. Um, what I will draw attention to is some of the, some of the information that's in here, like the re-referrals, like the repeat CPs, and the things that Ofsted have flagged off. Um, and those are things that we've been looking at for some time um, or reviewing at some point. Um, these are also things that you'll see in the corporate plan uh, performance updates that you'll get on a um, quarterly basis. So they are things, as, as we've said, they're things we know are issues and they're things that we've been trying to work towards resolving. Um, and this report um, gives you that information in, in a high level of where we were over the last few years, where we compare against our statistical neighbours, um, and England, um, and where we currently are at the end of quarter three, so the end of December. Okay, um, so that's what's in there. Um, there's a lot of detail in there. Um, what I will say is this is currently comparing our performance um, against statistical neighbours and England for 2020-21 year. The latest position is out, but it's not in this report yet. It will be in the next one. Um, <clears throat> but I have had time to make sure it's in the corporate plan for the next corporate plan release. Um, but if there's any questions you've got in here, I'm happy to try and talk them through. I'm also going to try and cover Hannah Dorr that's um, absent today that would normally cover EPS, but I, I will try and cover that aspect as well if there's any questions. Thank you, Paul. Um, Councillor Brasdell and then Councillor, I think we'll say Councillor McClay because she hasn't answered the question yet, then Councillor Harrison. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Carl touched upon this in her introduction. Um, one of the things that uh, was concerning to me in, in this particular report was on absence monitoring. Um, you know, all of us in this room, um, and particularly teachers, will be very aware of the impact um, of not attending can have, not just on progress, um, on terms of safeguarding matters, you know, in terms of the, the wider relationship with pastoral teams in school. Um, and actually, Annie's report in the next item, you know, discusses some of those, those very clear statistical correlations um, around some of that. So, um, you know, just wanted your attention, for instance, that, you know, between, from 2020, we're at 4.9 percent. In the current period, just looking at two terms, you know, we've nearly doubled already without going into a third term there, um, nearly 9 percent. Um, and the gulf between us in Plymouth and the England average for <coughs> persistent absence is quite huge, 22% um, to 29. Um, so I'm just interested um, whether you could say a little bit more around why you think there is that statistical difference between us and the national picture. Is that socioeconomic? Is this a, um, 
you know, a, a further result from some of the issues around the Plymouth Challenge, which has been going on for some time around leadership in the city, um, just to get a sense of, of your understanding of that picture. Annie, do you want to come in? It, it is concerning, as you say in the next report, it sets out really starkly the difference that attending, well, or the correlation between attending well and achievement is, is really set out, and for therefore those children not attending well, the chances of them getting those basics in English maths at the end of secondary school, age 16, really diminish, and that affects their life chances significantly. Quite apart from safeguarding issues, health issues that arise from, from not being part of the, the school community. Um, it is, it, absence has really significantly increased, increased across the whole country. So um, we see that rise and, and we'll see those graphs in the next report. Um, but you are right that Plymouth is sitting above that and that is a concern. And that is particularly true of our year nines, tens and elevens. You see uh, as the children become older um, and there might be a range of reasons behind that. I think it would be useful to um, dig into that further. Um, see, those children uh, sometimes are more independent of their parents, um, so they might be making some of their own decisions more. They may find that uh, school is less appealing for them, and I think lying behind some of the national change in that sense is, well, I didn't have to go to school during pandemic, so maybe it's not quite such that critical thing that it always was probably when most of us were at school. Um, so. I think there are a range of national issues. Locally, we need to look into it. I do think that, and I think head teachers recognise this as well, there's that push on inclusion across the city that we need to maintain, and I'll say a bit more about that uh, with the next paper as well. But I do think that children need to feel welcomed at their school and that they belong there, because there is a particular issue, I think, about some of our children with special educational needs missing out, not attending as well, um, as well as a higher proportion for our free school meal children. Yep. Yeah, just as a, as a follow up to that, um, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, further exploration of this would be welcome because a lot of what you said around COVID and around age, you know, applies nationally. But what we're seeing here is, is a worse picture, you know, in this local authority. So I was wondering whether a, a committee recommendation could be for absence to be a specific topic for a future report to scrutiny committee um, and whether we could have slightly more granular data um, for instance around geographic communities that you know this might be a particular issue in um, and I, I don't know how this would go in terms of the data side and GDPR, but um, it, I would be really interested to see this on map level data as well, just to see whether there are patterns in terms of how particular organisations are, are approaching this now that that's such an important aspect of how school leadership is, is run in the city. Thank you. Sharon? Yeah, just to build on, on um, what Annie said, so we, we do work with across the city with all our academy trusts. There may be an issue around data sharing, what can be shared here, but I think you already know that. Um, so we have a place-based plan and we have um, in the autumn term, I think we mentioned it at the last meeting, the uh, an information sharing agreement so we can compare what's happening in different places and spaces and look at nuances. So the place-based plan is a city-wide initiative with all of our schools looking at attendance and absence. And that's really just starting to work now. And I think there are things we can bring here, but whether, whether we can bring the level of data you're suggesting, I probably we can't. Um, but I think we can absolutely bring the place-based plan, share that with you, but also share our role as a system leader and the work of Annie and the team in that space. Um, we have made that an absolute priority for us now. The, having that information means that we can absolutely understand the issues and we've got a wicked issue around in-year mobility that is driving some of this and there is a task force for that and some additional resource from the Department of Education coming in to do that across the city. So I think we can bring some of it at the next meeting or, or subsequent committees, but, but not all of it because of the information sharing requirements. Um, can I just come back on that? Sorry, and then I will go to the questions. I get that, you know, some of that, we're not talking about naming and shaming at all, but and I get that there would be sensitivities around some of that. But but can you reassure us that some of that granular work is going on, so that you are identifying if there are? I'm not saying there are, but if there are particular um, schools or clusters where this is occurring more, then I think we really need to know that because then we then it's for you and for Annie then to have those difficult conversations that lead from that to to, to try to unpick what is going on there. So I guess. 
you're not going to say particular um, schools or trusts or whatever, but an assurance for us that that granular work is being done. Yes, I think it's absolutely right that I think it's a, it is a priority for us. It's a real priority for the schools and for the children and families. So I think it's absolutely right that this committee examines it more and that we bring more detail about the processes that, that we carry out, but also that through the place-based place plan um, and strategic education board that trusts are carrying out with their schools because they're the ones in day-to-day -day contact uh, with head teachers, etc. So we need them to be working as well as possible and us to be providing that both wraparound and then particular input where there are real concerns and those discussions with um, CEOs and head teachers. Um, so I welcome it being on the agenda further. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McClay. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, sorry. sorry um, Paul. Just come in, just in case it changes any of the questions that are coming. Um, the, the I just wanted to add some clarity here. Where you compared the 8.8 .8 against the 4.9, it's, it's important to bear in mind that the 2021 uh, 2020-21 is COVID year, um, so it will be impacted. What would be good to see is um, when the information for 21-22 is released next month, how we compare. Yes. All right, so it's just worth bearing that in mind. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Councillor McClay. Thank you, Chair. This is also a call for perhaps a little bit more detail. So I'm on page 25, particularly in relation to the statistic that 70 76% of children in care are placed within 20 miles of their home address. I find that quite surprising. To me, 20 miles still feels very far away. Um, that can be up to an hour away from, from their home. And I don't doubt that these young people are going into a space as a good fit. Um, but I imagine that being taken into care is a very challenging time and being separated from friends, school activities, support structures could make this uh, a more difficult time than perhaps it needs to be. So I was wondering if we could break that statistic down a little bit further within 10 miles, say, just so we can understand how big that displacement might be. Who wants to take it? So I'll just, I'll just come in again. So this is, um, so that 76% is based on some um, work that is under development, but I can do that. But I would just put a caveat on that, that you know, if, if someone's come in and they're homeless, we don't have a postcode starting from. Uh, if they've come in as an unaccompanied asylum seeker, we don't have a home postcode, mm -hmm. and it'll be thousands <laughs> of miles. Um, so I can do it, and I can do that um, this week, try and give you a quick response. Um, but yeah, that's not an issue. Thank you, Jane. Did you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. Just, just to say that. Um, so in, in companion with this kind of oversight, and that's absolutely the right question because we know, we know children educationally, socially, in terms of relationships, need to be in their communities and close to home as possible. Um, so there, there has also been additional oversight from Corporate Parenting Group on this issue, and there has been quite a detailed breakdown provided before. So, um, um, yeah, that, that data is available, and we can certainly share it if it's, if it's um, helpful. Thank you. Got a supplementary? Uh, no, thank you so much. That's very useful. Lovely. Thank you. OK, so Councillor Has Harrison and then Councillor Criswell. Thank you, Chair. Um, mine's continuing on, on around children uh, in care, but this is care experienced. Uh, so page 26, I'm looking at the, the figures for the uh, young people that are in, in unsuitable accommodation. I'm, I'm pleased to see that it's reduced. You know, so that's because I know that's something that I raised, uh, I've raised previously, but obviously it's still 5.6% of, of our young people 16 to 18, 18 to 20 are, are in um, sort of unsuitable accommodation. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, work is continuing with that uh, to, to move that forward. And I know that obviously we've spoken, well, certainly as part of the budget scrutiny, there's been talk about using, trying to find alternative accommodation that might be suitable, properties, etc., that we that might be able to be converted to allow for um, you know, young people and families to be able to move into. So hopefully that's part of that work. Uh, so that's a question on that. Um, the second part of it, though, is a look at the amount of um, care experienced young people who are in education, employment and training, and those that are neat, as in not in education, and see that it's 52.8%, which is the same as uh, it's already been alluded to, was COVID year. What is being done? to address this you know we've got a um the covenant um in in plymouth to try and support our care our care experienced young people what has been done to give them the additional support to make sure that they are um in you know in in somewhere that is um a suitable for for them to progress 
um, and, and you know, to have the best outcomes. Jane and then Sharon's going to come in. Thank you. So, um, so thank you. So to take, to take the per first point about unsuitable accommodation, um, yeah, it, it, it is um, a positive, I think, for us to see such a low level by comparison to our national and also to previous um, um, indicators in that area. Um, it is an area of extremely strong oversight, so it's an area that we, we, we focus on in weekly performance surgeries um, in terms of our responsibilities to corporate parents. Um, some of those young people, it's probably just worth clarifying, are in settings such as um, they might be in custody um, and in other settings where they would feature in, in here as in unsuitable accommodation, but they are in accommodation that's um, required for them at the time. For others, a small proportion, it's, it's 10, that number, a small proportion of those even more will be um, care experienced young people that are currently um, not in secure settings and accommodations and um, where we can, of course, these are adults, so where we can, we are absolutely tenacious in reaching out to them, trying to support and engage um, with them. Um, yeah, and it's very, very strong, as I say, weekly focus in our, in, for, at all levels of our organisation and reporting directly to me. Um, in relation to our EAT um, figures, and I, I, Sharon might want to pick up something on this also. Um, so there's there's the wider work of the city, which I'll leave Sharon to pick up um, on, and then there's also the focused work within our um, permanency service and our care leaders response team. Um, so we are um, um, connected to the comment you were making earlier, Councillor Lang, around what the, the learning, the national learning that we, we've taken from our work with Mark Riddell, the DfE advisor for care leaders. Um, uh, going to pilot some um, um, EAT education employment training specialist uh, PA support and that will be a joint funded post um, with some um, with uh, EPS um, colleagues in post 16 um, EPS. Um, we've had some good success in terms of the prevention and reduction of homelessness and risk of homelessness through a similar initiative and we're going to build on those strengths and, to, and target some work around EET so there'll be an incentivisation scheme and model um, and we're hopeful that that will give us the same benefits, will give young people the same benefits that we see in other local authorities. So wider, I'll pass over. Thank you. Um, so earlier I referred to a diagnostic that I did when I first arrived, so NEAT was high on the agenda. Um, and there is a new Seeking Education, Employment and Training Strategy that our colleagues have been working very hard on that comes to our next performance DMT. That's a citywide response to this. Um, so really taking the time to understand it and create a strategy for a number of years to, to fix this and support this. Some of our issues, though, are about our current um, intake of children in care and those that are coming in care and particularly thinking about adolescents who might enter into care and have already had a very disrupted education then if we're unable to place in the city because of sufficiency they'll be out of area and then bringing them back in the area creates issues so as well as really thinking about the role of the virtual school and working with colleagues in Annie's team, really thinking about our sufficiency challenges, our fostering care recruitment strategies, but moreover and more importantly, perhaps our adolescent response to prevent them entering into care in the first place and really doing that early intervention piece of work. So I think we have some, some of our issues are um, really need to be dissected into terms of understanding what we need to do for our current cohort, but how we fix the system earlier on to prevent that escalation happening. So more than happy to bring that here at the appropriate juncture. There's a new strategy. We have some tremendous assets in the city and the skills launch pad. As Jane's just described, a forensic focus on that cohort. Um, and again, our partnership with Bernardo is really understanding, back to earlier on, what are our young people saying about their education experience and how do we make it better, both at the point of entry into care, but really thinking about apprenticeship, aspirations and opportunities um, so I'm very confident when you see the strategy, that will be the long-term approach. But the here and the now, the work of Karen Blake and her team, Jan Forshaw and her team, we are forensically focused on how we support those and linking into Tina and Annie's space. Thank you. OK. Uh, Councillor Creswell and then Councillor Riley, and then I think we're a little bit over time, but I think we stop for 10 minutes for a quick break. For everything. It's, a, it's a kind of a follow-up on, on what you've been saying, particularly in terms of... Um, of needs those those youngsters who aren't in um, education or um, or employment or training, and uh, what I'd particularly like to sort of flag up, which I think is some work that's probably being done, is about those young people who have um, an EHCP and about helping them into um, 
apprenticeships and internships so that they are actually supported. And if you think about the, the work that goes on when young people go from primary school to secondary school who have an EHCP, we wouldn't for one moment not consider having a, a very elaborate um, tra um, transition system, very often with a transition system for those children which is very much enhanced when they go from primary to uh, secondary. Uh, and then we're looking at the at those young people going into some sort of uh, training or apprenticeship or whatever, and not then many of them not having any kind of enhanced support, which seems absolutely um, amazing when you consider the kind of work that goes on for that transition from year, year six to year seven. You would imagine that there would be, because otherwise, if there isn't something in, like that in place, you are actually setting them up to simply fail. Uh, whereas with the appropriate support, they can actually succeed. And that has a huge impact uh, on, on the rest of their lives. Sharon, did you want to come in and then Annie? I'll say one thing very briefly, then I'll pass over to, to Annie, because she'll answer it better than me. Year nine is a really focused year for our annual reviews for our children with education health care plans to really understand how we support them through that next phase of the process, both true for our children in care, but also our universal cohort with the HCPs and SEND support. So that is absolutely an area of focus for the team. But the broader issues, I'll pass over to Annie. Yeah, because I think one of the things we need to do is make sure that there are those opportunities there and then advise the children well and support them to make that transition. Um, so uh, Tina, who Sharon's mentioned, Tina Brinkworth, who oversees the skills area, is working very intensively with employers about uh, creating more supported internships. We have a low number, but there's real interest from employers in providing more opportunities, uh, which I think is very positive. Um, we do have um, a good variety but not necessarily a full sufficiency of places at college and in schools for young people with EHCPs. It's simply more the support into employment, either whether that happens when they're 16 with some training or 18. Um, and then, as Sharon said, it's very much part of the work of the team who oversee the education healthcare plans to make sure that in year nine, when the child is 14, they're getting really strong advice about what their options are as they look ahead. But I think there is more we are doing and we will see the number of supported internships um, really increase over the coming years with the work that's going on. Thank you, Annie. Annie, follow up? No, I, 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 think that, I think this is a real focus that we need to have. If we want to try and bring down um, our, our, our needs, we really have to focus on, on, on that that cohort mm. uh, because we, we really want them to be successful and uh, and that sort of like <coughs> a targeted focus which I think is going to be and going to be very effective in terms of working not just with schools but working with those places which actually offer training as well. Thank you. Councillor Riley. Uh, yeah sorry if I'm not clued up on this being new and all. Um, what is our I know that we briefly touched on this in our last meeting. What is our responsibility to care leavers from out of Plymouth that come here. Presumably, if we're sending some to away from Plymouth, we're also getting some back. What, what is the local connection aspect there? Are they entitled to, to help? Thanks. So the, the statutory responsibility lies with the local authority. So our care experience young people, where they live in the country, have a, have a um, as, as far as possible, have um, um, parity in terms of our offers to our local children. So whether it be, for example, support with council tax or support with learning education, that offers there um, until their 25th birthday. And in fact, in, 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 in often cases, we're going beyond that in terms of um, some of the services we're offering, such as Ask Jam, which is a lifelong offer for care experienced young people. So, yeah, but it is with a determining local authority. It, does that include accommodation? So it, it includes responsibilities to ensure, to support, advise, assist and offer. Um, so some elements of that are financial responsibilities in terms of setting up home, for example. Yep. Um, and others of those are, re are really around the allocation of support and advice through the personal advisor. So there's a range of responsibilities and they're all set out in our care leavers offer. That'd be helpful to distribute. Just about to um, update that again. That just sets out all of our responsibilities and an additional um, offers that we make to our care experienced young people. That's really helpful, thank you. Okay, I think if we just stop for, come back at 20 past, so everybody, oh, Paul. 
Sorry, I've just done a bit of number crunching, so I can offer up those uh, distances in a bit more detail oh, if you'd like. That was quick. Well, I'd like to try. Um, <laughs> um, 8% of those children are five, between 5 and 10 miles, 4% 10 and 15 miles, and 1% 15 and 10 miles, and that's of, as of today. And then there's the other 24-ish that are more than 20 miles. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for such a quick bit of number crunching, and thank you for, for your... Um, the information you've given us around the performance scorecard, so the committee notes the report, and I think if we just come back at 20 past, everybody can have a quick stretch their legs and whatever else they need to do. Thank you. Which is school attainment, so can I hand over to Councillor Carlisle to introduce the report, and then Sharon Muldoon, Annie Gammon, Jim Barnicott, is he online? or? Oh, is it right? Okay. So it, it'll be Sharon and Annie. So uh, thank you. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think we, we have to, like have had had some officers missing because obviously this has fallen into half term. But I know Sharon's flagged it up with Democratic for Future meetings. Um, obviously, with school attainment, before I pass over to Annie, as I said before, with our performance scorecard, as you can see, it's really good to see some progress here for uh, some of our children and united and clear focus on who are not regularly accessing education or absent. And you know, when the attainment sort of continues to fall behind, as we know that that's when the problems seem to happen. And also just to highlight that we're going to have a particular area of focus is on free school meals as well, because oh, it's something important. But I'm going to pass over to Annie so she can fill in the gaps better. Thanks very much. So um, you've got the um, report there starting on page 33, if you've got the, the pack. Um, and if I, I think, uh, as Councillor Carlisle has said, we should be pleased about the progress, but not satisfied. I think more progress is needed, but pleased to see an upturn at those end of key stage four results on a number of measures. Um, so if I start from the uh, chart on page 34, that one at the top where you can see um, an increase from 2018-19, which was the last year there were proper exams, because as you know, during the pandemic, there were two years where um, grades were either centre assessed or teacher assessed. Um, so there were some mitigation was put in place for students for last year with some advanced notice about topics, uh, but they were definitely examined. Um, and the upturn for Plymouth, you know, is a steeper rate of improvement than for um, national southwest and statistical neighbours. So I think we should be pleased about that. The um, the graph below, which is entitled Average Progress 8, which is chart 2, tells us why we shouldn't definitely not be satisfied yet. Um, progress 8, that green column at the end is still negative, so minus 0 0.2, whereas nationally, a, a sort of national, um, getting the same as everybody nationally on aggregate would be zero. Um, so, and you, so we still have work to do. Um, the chart at the top of page 35 is significant, I think, the, um, again, still more to do, but that change from around 38% to almost 46% for students getting grades five and above in English and maths is really important. That's such a gatekeeper to A-levels, to level three courses. Um, so we're really pleased with that change, but again, it needs to absolutely continue. Uh, we want that to be... Um, at or above national averages. Um, and probably worth just touching on the narrative below that about three reasons. One um, is the introduction of the, some more multi-academy trusts, high-performing multi-academy trusts taking on some of the secondary schools. Um, and that probably links with that, the final paragraph there about our secondary schools moving towards being um, increasing numbers of being good or outstanding. So the figure's now at 67%, whereas 2019 it was 47%, really significantly below national averages then. Um, and the middle paragraph there talks about the place-based approach or the place-based plan, which we've talked about, which is those multi-academy trusts working together. And English and maths has been one of the key strands of their joint work. So some of the leadership of that improvement across trusts is some really strong training on English and maths teaching led by school-based practitioners. Um, so that's been significant. Um, and then just at the bottom of page 35, following on uh, what I was saying about the good and outstanding schools, um, if you, that top row is what students get who are at good or outstanding schools. 
Um, so progress eight around zero, attainment around 52. Um, but it requires improvements. Schools, the children are coming out half a grade lower, minus 0.55. So minus 0.5 is half a grade lower on average. Um, and the attainment eight, a drop down again. And then um, are thankfully a very small number of students now in adequate schools, but there's a drop again there. So um, the driver for all schools to be good or outstanding in Plymouth must continue. Um, and we need to keep attention on that. And that encompasses a number of things around the quality of education, the, um, the pastoral care for children, um, the leadership, of course, is really important there. Um, there's a gender level analysis next, um, and you will see that both boys and girls have improved. Um, there is a gap between genders. It's quite similar to <laughs> national. Um, so I won't say too much more about that. It is a factor that uh, education professionals in the schools and multi-academy trusts are aware of and something that they pay attention to in terms of um, certainly sometimes some of the work in English, which has traditionally been a subject where girls have done better than boys and the, the choice of text is quite important. Um, Moving on to page 37, and you've got the free school meal level analysis. And again, it's really pleasing to see a sharp improvement after a slight drop. Um, so that's good to see an increase, but we know that there is still a gap on that attainment score um, for pupils, how they're achieving if they're entitled to free school meals compared to others. And, and, and you'll be well aware that that is a real um, so it's indicator of uh, financial deprivation. Um, I think the other thing that is worth pointing out in the final paragraph under the free school meal level analysis on page 37 is that the uh, absence rate for children on free school meals is higher than others. So that's quite a concern. They're a group who, who absolutely need the best quality education. They need to be in schools and yet they're, those who are seriously absent or persistently absent fall more into the category of the free school meals than others do. Um, and you can see that laid out in the next chart as well. Um, I'm going to move on to talking about the children who are entitled to SEN support. Um, and again, you can see a, a pleasing upturn um, for Plymouth. We know that those children still do less well than children without SEN support, so work to continue, but pleased to see that improvement there. Um, and you can see that also quite a step up from the last recorded data in 2019 on the numbers getting five plus in English and maths. Um, also on page 39, we return to attendance, which we were talking about earlier, um, and the very stark figures in that first paragraph about 58.7% um, of pupils who had more than 90% attendance achieved that strong pass that grade five in English and maths. But for those who had less than 90%, only 30.7%, it's almost half. Um, and for those who got less than 50%, those serious absentees, um, of whom clearly there are complex issues if they're only at school half, less than half the time, it's only 3% of pupils. So I think it's absolutely right that we focus on attendance. It is, it is a national issue and there is new guidance coming into force and new approaches across the country. Um, and that's when we come back to talk attendance, we'll say more about that and the role of the local authority in that um, and a, a bigger role for schools and a slightly different role for the local authority working particularly with those seriously absent pupils. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions or Sharon, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Um, I, I just start by saying, I think it's a phrase I haven't really heard before, but you use it a lot around the wicked issues. Um, you know, ab absence is the thing that's absolutely jumping out and absolutely that we need to be tackling and trying to get to the bottom of. Um, but I expect that will come out in the questions. Um, Councillor Tibbetts. Thank you very much, Chair. And my question is about the free school meal uh, analysis. Um, 
I know as a former recipient of free school meals myself that uh, pupils don't always understand uh, their full entitlement and I believe it's really really important that each and every pupil who's entitled to this knows how to access every little thing that they're able to so we can give them the best possible chance to achieve and then you know hopefully you know continuing to do work like that we can see that green line go above the england average uh, so you know just to sum up what are we doing to ensure pupils fully understand their entire offer of entitlement when it comes to free school meals yeah it's a good question because i think that uh, it sounds like well you get your free lunch and that's it but actually each school gets a grant the pupil premium grant uh, which they're responsible for spending to support the education of the children who are entitled to free school meals or have been entitled in the past six years um schools do have to report they have to put on their website how they're using that pupil premium grant um that's often there for a wider audience and i think they don't always let the individual family know what else they're entitled to um it might come across in the sort of well if there is a cultural visit that the children who are entitled to free school meals don't need to pay for that um, but I do think that there probably is more that can be done um, and we can write to schools and talk to head teachers about ensuring that children and families um, do know what they're entitled to and what they're really <coughs> spending that money on, what they're offering. Just to build on that, um, prior to Annie's arrival, we have written out um, twice this year, yeah, just to promote that and make sure those that do, but we'll, we'll obviously continue to do that. Have you got Supplementary. No, my only supplementary is going to be maybe putting it as a committee recommendation, but if it's already happening, I don't see the point in uh, but, uh, putting that Can forward. you just clarify what's happening, who you write to? So Amanda and the team, right out to heads. Um, I think the uh, first term and this term, and we'll continue to do it just to promote and make sure that we encourage the appropriate actions around it. So that, that happens business as usual. But the specific thing you're saying is about telling families what that what what that pupil premium um, means that once their child and the ever six and all the rest of it and yeah. whether schools tell families what that means for them um, and I wonder if that could be a recommendation that we, we could look at how schools disseminate that information then to the mm. next level about what it does actually mean to make sure everybody's getting what they're entitled to and we're supposed to have voted on Tom's recommendation but I'm going to leave the recommendations to the end but I think that should be um, a recommendation thank you very much yeah, thanks very much Chair. Um, Councillor Harrison. Um, thank you, Chair, and I'll um, move on with uh, what Councillor Tippett has, has said. Not only with the schools, uh, if we're looking at the family hubs going on board, which obviously is from April, uh, you know, we, family hubs, children's centres traditionally have not got involved in, in free school meals in the same way. They might have been looking at healthy start vouchers, but they wouldn't have been looking at free school meals. So we need to take on board that we need to make sure that that education is with the family hubs as well because free school meals is obviously for the older the wider rider age thank you um, councillor creswell yes I, I wanted to ask the uh, the the issue of um which is an issue right the way through the school system of the uh the difference between girls and boys performance and um, particularly thinking about uh english which i think english is is, is such it's it's that it's one of the key it's probably i know we talk about maths as well but it is the key subject and uh what i particularly wanted to ask was i know that we talked last time at the last meeting about um work that's being done or is meant to be coming in which is actually about boys and reading and actually teaching reading right the way through secondary school uh, i also wanted to ask about and this relates to something i think you've just mentioned briefly is to do with text selection and what how much work there is sort of um drawing together english teachers at um at uh, key stage three key stage four in order to select texts that are actually perhaps boy appropriate. I don't wish to actually exclude girls from this, but um, but to actually select texts which are um, appropriate to those those particular children. Thank you. And I know that in the place based plan, one of the absolute key strands was English and maths through all phases, early years, key stage one, key stage two, key stage three, key stage four. Um, and schools stepped forward who had the expertise stepped forward to provide that training and I know that gender was part of that I don't have 
more details than that at my fingertips, but I can provide more a, a, a written report about what they've been doing, um, if that would be helpful. Yeah, that, that would be, yes, that, that would be helpful. But that is that is something that, that and perhaps Councillor uh, Browse-Dell can actually uh, answer some of that in, in a sense as well, is actually choosing texts which are, which are boy appropriate to actually engage them. Uh, and and I think probably it's it's easier to do that right the way through primary school than it is when you get into um, secondary school where there are very much set texts for GCSE. Thank you. So, Councillor McClay and then Councillor Riley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, looking at attendance, I'd really love to know if we have any data break, breaking that down by absence type, just so we can start to understand the barriers that are facing children from attending school regularly. Like, is it illness? Is it bullying and safety? Family issues? Inadequate transport? Caring responsibilities? I think that list could go on and on, but it'd be really good for us to understand if we can help break down any of those barriers for those kids. We do have some more granular detail, I believe, because the absences are coded, as you've indicated, perhaps not quite in those same criteria, but they are coded. Um, and certainly in the last couple of years, we've known whether an absence was COVID related or something else. Um, so I think we can do that and we should probably do that as part of the work we do on attendance, um, looking at it internally as well um, and in that way that we're, we've got the data and can talk to particular schools about it, but providing this group with an overview of key issues. You want supplementary? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Riley? Uh, yeah, it's, um, my question is on the vulnerable children. <coughs> so, children who are on free school meals are more likely to miss out on school. Children who are um, come from vulnerable backgrounds are more likely to. So, in my, in my patch, in my ward, um, there is the NSPCC who are piloting work with families and vulnerable who are being you know flagged up as vulnerable is there joint is there is there a joined up approach to to this and is it kind of you know because obviously they work a lot on adverse childhood experiences which runs through families so if a child is struggling his parents have probably struggled and their parents have probably struggled so is there kind of any any joined up organization work there um there certainly is there's Good join up at the moment between the education, well-being, and attendance team who link in with every school and with early help and social workers. It will become even more joined up through the localities model um, because there will be those teams working together in different areas who who know each other. Are we were talking about the same cases? And indeed, the work that's coming through the national changes about um, the local authority being really responsible for the most complex cases, probably those children who are attending less than 50%, um, which the schools just can't manage by themselves uh, through their outreach, I think will is one of the drivers behind that join up. But Sharon, you might want to say a bit more about the locality work. Yeah, so it's it's really having that consistent approach, um, but it's also, I think back to our early conversations, understanding communities and understanding the different stressors that might be in different community groups. So. The locality approach that, that, that Annie's just outlined brings all those colleagues working that space together. Um, and just earlier today, we were talking about once we're in that space, how we have those set meetings to look at the children that we're most worried about. Um, but more importantly, really using the data to get in early um, so that as soon as we start to understand what's happening and, and, and your point, Councillor Riley, in terms of you know understanding the historical um, relationship in that family, their engagement with education, um, and, and link back into the Family Hubs programme, including supporting parents as well. So um, I think we're at the moment building that together, um, but the event on the 26th of April, which I've talked about, will be where we will be talking about that approach. Schools know it's coming. They are very, um, from the meeting we had last week, with them very excited about the offer and feel that the, the key thing is having a relationship and a discussion with everybody rather than different parts of the system. So. Um, if you can bear with us, by April we'll be able to, to absolutely show you what localities will look like and make sure we get those relationship and conversations happening really early on for our children and people. Okay. Uh, th yeah, thank you. Because I think uh, having these conversations with people and actually finding out that lots of my residents 
they homeschool and whether they're just homeschooling because they're keeping their kids at home and they're reading or are actually going through proper avenues of homeschooling because they say there's no resources and there's no this and there's no that presumably they're keeping their children off but there's a lack of trust particularly in those with a, a poorer um, income there's a lack of trust to people who deem themselves higher educated and so I think yeah that that would be fantastic uh, Councillor Allen and then Councillor Beer, and then I think we'll need to end this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report shows analysis of children at SEN support. Is that all children that have been identified as needing SEN support, and do all of those children have EHCPs? No, they don't have EHCPs, so there would be um, around, I don't know the numbers exactly, um, Sharon might know them, I, around 20% of children are identified as needing some sort of SEN support, and around 3% have EHCPs, so that doesn't include the children with EHCPs. Can I ask a supplementary? Um, obviously, as a ward councillor I do get contacted from time to time by parents frustrated um, at being unable to get their children an EHCP or even the um, the step is it team around me which is the not quite as full-on as the EHCP so I just wonder it would be useful if we could actually have that data included in this report because otherwise I don't think we have a full story and also um, waiting times for applying for EHCPs as well would be really helpful. Okay, um, I have that information, so I can share that now. Um, in terms of those children are on SEN support, the cohort that Anna's just talked about, there are 7,249 in the city. In terms of children who actually have an EHCP, 2,660. Um, in terms of waiting times, really positively, I know we talked about this before, so for um, parents in November who applied for an EHCP, um, their six weeks decision was 95% and that's been maintained, um, in, sorry, in January it's 94%. That's um, against a southwest average of 49%. So we, um, it was a key area of focus um, from June onwards and we've doubled our performance. So at six weeks there isn't the delay that there used to be. That's very positive and evidence of my team working well. Um, in terms of the 20-week decision, so colleagues, six weeks is a do we proceed to an education health care plan. Um, we in November were at 38%, in January we're now at 76%. Um, so again, you'll see that we've really, really focused on ensuring that families aren't waiting any longer than, than they need to. There will be, and one of the areas of focus for us is making sure that families, um, back to the early help offer, um, really engage in that because sometimes there might be a view that a plan's necessary when actually what's needed is support and early support. So we work very closely with the Plymouth P Parent Care Forum. I meet with them every month where they um, talk about their experiences. We've had a um, parent and carer survey that was went out in December and we're analysing that now. But I think positively um, th there, may, there may be an a, a historic experience of long delays they are not happening in our city now and it has been an absolute area of focus and again recognition to colleagues in my team Annie and others who have absolutely focused on driving that through. Thank you that's a good question good answer. Um, Councillor Beer. Um, I just want to backtrack slightly on um, attendance at school um, has uh, pupils being taken out of school for holidays uh, had a huge impact on attainment because um, we've had issues with that in the past and obviously parents are under pressure to take, take their children on holiday as well um, and I just wonder whether that is having an impact on um, attendance at school these days. Thank you. Thanks very much. I don't have the figures on that. Um, but I do know anecdotally that there were um, head teacher colleagues across the country have said there was a sort of backlog of people not having been able to go on holiday for two years. Um, and <laughs> for, um, so they, they felt that that was more of an issue than it had been previously. Um, but again, when we have the analysis of the uh, reasons for absence, we can look at that. 
Paul's looking like he might know the I've numbers. Got an idea. Thank you. So I think we will uh, bring this item to a close. So we'd already discussed, obviously, in the previous discussion that we want absence to be something on the work programme going forward, a real proper deep dive into all the points that everyone's raised. So we're going to note the report and then move on to um, item 11. And I think David has been waiting very David has been waiting very patiently there for us. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, David. Thank you for waiting. That's OK, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you this afternoon. I'll just very quickly <coughs> touch on the month nine report, if I may, which is in the pack. And as always, it's it's a report for the full council. So um, we need to note that in terms of overall position, we are still heading in the right direction and moving towards our um, intended balance position by the end of uh, March this year. What, what this committee wants to look at is what's happening within the children's directorate and you will see in the, in the table that the net prov, uh, position as at month nine is 2.757 million overspend, which is a, a gross of 4.9 and then mitigations of 2.2. And I, I think the um, questions that we've had previously from the committee were about um, the status of those uh, 2.2 million of mitigations. So I'm quite happy to take questions on that chair and run through what those mitigations were, if that would be helpful. Uh, I think that would be helpful if everybody agrees. So I, I am aware, chair, that um, you did request that as these reports come forward, you do see the savings and the mitigations and the status. I think uh, given the fact that this was given quite a heavy scrutiny at the budget scrutiny sessions, uh, as well as conversations that we've had at this committee. Um, it, it seems to me that we need to be looking forward rather than back and, and talking to Sharon about what her plans are to, to mitigate any uh, actions in next year's budget rather than this one. But having said that, the mitigations were fairly straightforward in terms of placement reviews, as you would imagine. Um, Reduction in court fees, court assessments, family support reviews, out of hours working, um, a, a challenge to the education, participation and skills department to um, come in with over £300,000 worth of management savings, which they have achieved. Uh, I know I've been asked on several occasions about the uh, one particular item, which was a £500,000 contribution from our um, Devon Health colleagues and uh, I have said previously and I will continue to say at this point Chair if I may that uh, given the the changes to the uh, what used to be the CCG and is now the Inter Integrated Care Board and the new management structures etc those negotiations continue and I will of course keep a, a close watch on development but at this stage I cannot say to you that the £500,000 has been received but uh, most, most of the um, mitigations that were put in place by Sharon to to pull down that overspend are coming to fruition. Thank you well, you saved me my question there David you answered it before I asked it. Um, Sharon did you want to add anything? Yeah, thanks, David. I think obviously it's just about that focus. The main pressure, colleagues know, is around um, the cost of our placements for our children in care. And we, we continue to, to focus on that and also make sure we, we <laughs> walk that careful balance around where children need to come into care to be supported. Then absolutely that will be the case. So Jane, myself and Annie are working very closely on that. We'll continue to do so. As David says, we're probably moving towards looking towards next year now in terms of our budget plans for next year. Thank you. Um, any questions? No? Thank you. OK, so we'll note the forecast revenue monitoring position at period nine as set out in the report in the sum of £2.812 million. Thank you. Um, thank Excellent. You. Thank you, Chair. Yep. <laughs> Bye. Um, we we'll move on to item 12. Now, we haven't got an officer here for this, but I guess, Sharon, you can answer questions. Um, the risk monitoring report, this item will be assumed red. And so if there are any questions, um, we will uh, we'll get those answered offline. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, does anybody have any questions around the uh, risk monitoring report? 
Okay, right. Well, we'll note the current position with regard to the strategic risk register. Um, and now we're going to move on to item 13, which is refugee and asylum seekers accessing education in Plymouth. Really grateful um, to Dr. Lucinda Ross, um, A, for waiting, and B, for coming in on annual leave to um, update us on this item. Really very grateful of you for, for, to you for doing this. Um, so I'm going to hand Thank it to you now, and you're going to present us with a, a verbal report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I'm submitting a verbal report, but I can send it um, to Jake Metcalf for um, sharing later. So an update on asylum seeker refugee children in education in the city. Currently, there are approximately 350 asylum seekers resident in the city, most supported by the UK border agency. Nationally and locally, there is no accurate data on the numbers of asylum seeker and refugee children in schools. Published data on asylum applications in the UK does not include numbers of dependents by age, and the school census does not capture these characteristics. However, local authorities and schools are required to demonstrate an awareness of diverse groups of pupils and their different needs, which of course includes asylum seeker and refugee children. Through the coordinated work of the Ethnic Minority Achievement Team, a small team working within education, participation and skills, um, I'll refer to that team as EMAT, the Education Ethnic Minority Achievement Team, EMAT, and through effective school induction procedures, however, um, those procedures for new arrivals from outside the UK with English as an additional language, we are often able to identify children potentially from asylum seeker backgrounds. EMAT work closely with schools, offering training and support in this area. We also work with external partners. And this is a vital, this is a vital part of our work, actually, as the majority of staff in our schools are not fully aware of challenges facing asylum seeking families, cultural difference, and many issues linked to equality and diversity. Um, this academic year, EMAT has provided 29 training sessions to schools across the city. So it's rather in demand. We're all really proud that Plymouth is committed to being a welcoming city. And as a city, we've engaged with several resettlement initiatives. I'm going to just talk very briefly through each of those. In 2014, Plymouth participated in the initial Afghan locally employed staff relocation scheme, relocating Afghan civilians who had served with UK forces in Helmand. At that time, across the council, we established very efficient coordinated systems, deploying home office grant funding for one year to support families in respect of welfare, accommodation, health and education. Since then, small numbers of Afghan families have been periodically settled in the city. Um, in 2021, this included 10 families with 25 children. EMAT have provided English language learning support for those children in school and training for teachers and liaised with partners to support the family's more general well-being. Overall, children in this group have made extremely good progress, with one young man in the first cohort going on to university. And case studies summarising the work um, in this area contributed to the city gaining City of Sanctuary status, which is, is great. Then between 2015 and 2021, the city welcomed individuals through the government's Syrian Vulnerable Person Relocation Scheme. The overall number includes 73 children under 18. EMAT have supported many children in this group and where possible, working in schools, we've included those children not part of the government funded package. 
These families present much greater need. However, most children have settled well and are making good progress. I must say that several families within the Syrian community continue to require additional support, although the grant funding has come to an end. And this highlights the way in which one year government grant funding is not always sufficient. And we continue to work with schools to help several families with the greatest level of need. There are also 15 children in the city within the Vulnerable Children's Resettlement Scheme from Sudan, Iraq, Somalia and Afghanistan. As yet, education have received no grant funding to support these children, but the EMA team staff include them when they're working with schools as much as possible. And uh, we provide advice and support for schools quite quite freely as much as our capacity allows. Then most recently the Homes for Ukraine scheme brought 57 children under 18 plus 10 18 year old unaccompanied asylum seeking children into the city. The unaccompanied asylum seeking children the 18 year olds in the care of Plymouth Virtual School are all attending City College and Suzanne Sparage, Sparrow Language School, and all are reported to be making very good progress working through ESOL, English, Maths and IT courses. The EMA team are supporting the children in schools um, with bespoke um, language support and offering staff training to the schools involved. The team also provided online tuition for the children over the school summer holidays, which was very successful. We had a very positive take up and a recent progress check um, that we're carrying out indicates that all the pupils in the Ukrainian group have settled really well in schools and are making good progress, although three families have recently returned to Ukraine. Um, the EMA team work with colleagues across the council schools and local charities to support asylum seeker and refugee children. Through long experience, we have good knowledge of families um, and keep database information um, on the children to support work with schools. The team is reliant upon periodic government grant funding and traded services income with schools, but work really hard because um, we recognise the importance of doing absolutely all that we can to close the gap for this um, most vulnerable group of children. And we see really positive results, which personally I feel very proud of. Um, you know, especially considering some of what we've seen in the news recently, um, we know that in Plymouth we work really hard to be that welcoming city. Thank you very much. I think um, your passion and your pride comes through and there's some really positive um, uh, information there about these, like you say, particularly vulnerable group of people in our city. I think I'm a bit surprised about some of the, the national data around, you know, not knowing about children and in families and things. I'm really surprised that that's not, and it kind of makes you realise how 200 children can... <laughs> you know, disappear off the radar if, if that's the case. It seems really strange. But um, anyway, thank you so much for that update. I know I've got Councillor Tippett, Councillor Bryce, Delve, and then if anybody else wants to put their hand up, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question is about uh, the, I, I suppose the specifically unaccompanied asylum seeker children that will then come into our care as looked after children and those who have previously been refugees or asylum seekers that then because of family situations become looked after children. Um, I know that there can be uh, serious issues um, when these children hit 18 because of their status in the UK and confusion about their national what their nationality actually is and I know in June of last year it the fee to actually help these children register as British citizens was waived by the government, so all looked after children can register for free. I was just wondering what we're doing to support those children who it is uh, the best interest for, for them to become British citizens, 
to make sure that they can get their British nationality, British passport, etc., so then they can continue to access things that we would want all of our children to access, like funding for uh, higher education and things like that as they go into adulthood. Yeah. Yes, um, that, that's a really good question, Councillor Tippett. Um, my colleagues who work within the virtual school would be able to um, give more general answers. But with regard to the 10 um, young people in this group at the moment, they're all here within the Homes for Ukraine scheme. And my understanding is that all 10 of them plan to hope for hope to return to Ukraine um, at some point in the future. Obviously we don't know whether that will be possible. Um, so with regard to that specific question, um, I could bring further updates, but I can only speak about the 10 young people that are involved at the moment. Thank you. Jane, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. So um, just to, so to clarify, for those young people that um, are become looked after children for Plymouth, um, it's part of our business as usual activity to ensure that they have the right to remain in their legal entitlement to pursue the earliest opportunity. And um, we have a strong track record of doing that for young people and children in our care so far. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I've totally forgotten who's next. Sorry, uh, Councillor Thank you. And to echo what Councillor Lang said, really appreciate the work you do on this area, Lucinda. It's incredibly important. Um, I don't know if you remember, but we spoke quite soon after the fall of Kabul about Plymouth children who were trapped in Afghanistan and trying to help schools prepare for their return um, and looking at ways of, of joining that up. Um, so just interested in um, what joined up thinking continues to happen around the, the trauma side of some of the experiences that, that these, these young asylum seeker or refugee families have experienced, um, not just in Afghanistan, but in um, Ukraine and Syria too. Um, and how are we assessing to what extent the trauma they might have experienced could be a barrier to education um, and linking up schools that have a, a particular um, situation you know with a higher prevalence of, of children in those communities within their schools thank you so um we have a good we have good systems within plymouth city council um jess dan leads the strategic group um made up of representatives from health um education place housing etc and um we, the group commissioned support from start for family welfare work. Um, so there is a wrap, I would say there is a good wraparound package supporting families in their first year. Um, and obviously I'm only representative of education. For many families, what we've seen is that that good wraparound care in the first year is very adequate. And then within education, I work very closely with schools and can say that the majority of children within each of the resettlement schemes, the majority of children have presented very low levels. And this is surprising. It's inspiring and surprising, but the majority of children have presented very low levels of um, social and emotional behavioural needs. The group that have presented um, most mental health or emotional needs are the Syrian resettlement children. And um, as I alluded to in my report, the government funding for the wraparound care packages only lasts for one year. And after that, you know, families are expected to gain work, move into private rented accommodation. With this, with several of the Syrian families, they, they have struggled with this. And this has led to homelessness, families living in temporary accommodation, children moving. Um, so one family, um, the children have been to four schools because of constantly moving through temporary accommodation. And when the funding runs out, the schools are still then um, working very hard to meet the children's needs as they would for any child. 
um, through their normal school budgets. Um, they would be working with um, colleagues um, to provide ed educational psychologist support, um, counselling, learning mentor support, etc. The EMA team have no funding to continue working with these children, but where where we have funding to work with other children in the schools, we fit these children in. Um, so we are really stretched, but we continue to support as much as we can because I um, feel that we have a duty of care to do everything that we can for these actually maybe the most vulnerable children in our in our school's community. So there is a challenge. Um, it is difficult and um, I, I, I think the case of the Syrian uh, families has really highlighted the need for longer support packages, you know, and, and personally, I would advocate that one year is not enough uh, to, you know, um, with the Afghan um, relocation, in the majority of cases, the families were middle class professional people. The fathers had worked as translators for the armed forces, so they had good English. The Ukrainians, um, again, we're seeing people coming with, you know, obviously from another Western society and by and large coming with pretty good English. The Syrians, um, many of them came from um, rural agricultural backgrounds. They didn't have English. They had first-hand experience of the traumas of war, and they were not used to living in a modern Western um, city like Plymouth. And so this is where we, we've seen um, the need for continued support. And um, yeah, even when the funding runs out, I will be honest and say that the myself and the two members of the EMA team, we are a very small team, we will go above and beyond to keep supporting schools as they work with these children. Thank you. I will come to Jane in a sec, but I'm feeling like a recommendation coming on around. <laughs> I think no, that's not. no uh, need. Just no need for a recommendation. We're just doing our job because actually, um, we work for we work in the interests of children. Everybody yeah. in education, participation, and skills. We all we all do. So no recommendations needed. Yeah. At all. No. 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 What I mean is, we as a committee can make a recommendation, and I think we should write you a letter could. to the relevant minister to say, actually, and everybody nodded, and as 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 you spoke, that a year's support package isn't long enough, and that maybe they need to look at somehow extending that support package. So sorry to maybe write another letter, Jake, but and maybe you can help us craft that, um, Lucinda. But um, I think I most think, yeah yeah uh, Jane, I most you, certainly could. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Did you want to come in? Yeah. Thank you. Um, just just it, it is certainly a challenging landscape, but just on a slightly more sort of positive picture, I think. So just in terms of speaking for our care experience, young people as well. So we we are fortunate to have a children care cam service that work directly with um carers providers and children care experiencing trauma and trauma recovery so that's a very focused kind of response to the to the question that you pose but um and additionally we do work closely with the devon and cornwall refugee support team and they do provide um responses both in terms of adult and care support around mental health and recovery from trauma but also a whole range of other kind of um, services as I'm sure you're aware around sort of social connectivity education health and, and other things so we're very linked into that and it's a very extensive checklist of um, responses as soon as um, we have a children rece a child received into our care in terms of our corporate parenting responses and that's just one of about 25 things that we do in the first week to connect with that service. Tom did you want to come back? Yeah, I just want to quickly respond to a couple of points. So I completely agree with what you're saying about the, the surprising positivity of particularly the, the Afghan children of those interpreters. I, I saw first-hand videos of some of their experiences out in Kabul and, you know, brought me to tears. And so the idea that these kind of children under the age of 10 were coming back, going straight into primary school and continuing normally their education, just amazing. And, and yeah, I was continually inspired by, by what 
they were able to do on their return. Um, you mentioned about the link with housing as well, which I think is so important. Um, one of the things we found from a, a casework perspective was that um, having to move between um, supported housing um, placements had a knock on effect of education because then if you're having to travel to the other side of the city to a school, you've then got the difficult dilemma of wanting to continue in the same school with those networks that those young people have established, you know, after a difficult period. Um, but then the, the financial aspect to that, um, you know, within our public transport model. Um, so just wondering whether, because this is a relatively small number of, of young people in um, asylum seeker or, or refugee families, whether that's something that can be looked at more around support for transport for those individuals having to move between um, school situations. So it realises it was a question that we can't answer in this committee today, but um, was just something that several families mentioned to me at the time and, and something small around that, you know, I do think could make a, a big difference to some of the tricky decisions they have to, to weigh up around access to, to schools and education. But thank you, Lucinda. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Harrison. Um, I just wondered, you said that there were 350 asylum seekers, but you had no, uh, there was no data around the amount of children, um, family, you know, dependents that came with them. Obviously, then you gave um, sort of a list of, of different ones. What are we doing about the ones that are not part of the list, or the ones that have not engaged with school? You know, how, what work is happening, obviously engaging with, with the organisations that are out there, potentially who are supporting them to to uh you know to to engage them if that is there, if they're not not uh, not known to us yeah so um this this is a national difficulty a long time ago like if we go back maybe 25 years the school census did um capture um whether a child was of asylum seeker or refugee background that no longer exists and um, so we only know of the children that are either part of our resettlement schemes that's great because we hold all the data on those children um, if the, if any other children become known to the EMA team through our links with Devon, Red Cro Devon and Cornwall Red Cross. Um, we work closely with START, students and refugees together, and also the other small Plymouth um, charities that support asylum seekers. If, if other children become known to us, then we would, um, I would check with admissions to find out which schools they were at, and then liaise with schools. Alternatively, if a school, um, this happens very, very rarely, I have to say, um, because most of the children with us are th part of the resettlement schemes, but occasionally a school head teacher might, um, through their induction processes, might judge that a child may be of asylum seeker background and contact me and then I can contact uh, Devon and Cornwall Red Cross um, are the main source and we can find out and the reason for finding out is just purely to be able to support the child and family um, schools do an awful lot as well I should say um, independently to support asylum seeker children um, there's a great willingness in our schools um, yeah um, they really do so so those are the ways we would know if we if we don't know then we don't know and that would be a national issue so that that's not a plymouth issue in fact i think in plymouth because of all of our resettlement schemes we have a pretty good data set um but there may be children that we we don't know of thank you I think and i don't know what the what we can do um about that actually and Annie, i didn't know if you wanted to come in quickly and then i think we will have to bring this item to an end thank you Liz. it was really around i think if the child is in school they're they're known to an organization they're on a register we they are known and that's important i think and um, really just picking up the point if perhaps a family moves in and they don't know that their child has to go to school or they don't know how to go about that. Uh, one would hope that the charitable organisations and neighbourhood organisations, early help, will will pick that up and make sure that they are 
helped to find to find a school place. Um, but there yeah. may, yeah, I think from what we're hearing, there may be a you know a, a loose end of a family that moves, and it's not known um, what happens to the children. Thank you. So um, I think we will leave that there. Thank you so much, um, Lucinda. Again, really appreciate you coming in, uh, interrupting your holiday. Um, so we're going to note the report. We'll do the recommendation at the end. Um, and we are going to move on to item 14, which is early years and childcare sufficiency. Um, I'm handing over to Councillor Carlisle to introduce this item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So we've currently, as you can see, we've got 245 Ofsted registered uh, childcare providers in Plymouth. Um, with those, and they actually do provide uh, su the sufficient demand for the places that we've currently got. We are having less child child minders though in the city, but this is part of a national trend. There's been a little bit of a some people being retired or changing um, careers, but that's sort of going into a bit more detail in the report. The quality and standards, those you'll be able to see further on, are good in the city, and the team are working hard to support those settings that are in RI. Um, and also, as Annie's sort of gone into a little bit more detail, there is areas in Plymouth that we need to keep a very close eye on, um, particularly those providing like a, that need high need, basically. I'm going to pass over to Annie now. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll summarise briefly, and my, and my thanks to colleagues who put the reports together but can't be with us because they would uh, probably talk with more local expertise than myself. So the first report is, um, as Councillor Carlisle has said, is about sufficiency, um, and we do have a duty to make sure there are sufficient places for families to find um, childcare, both in the sense of daycare while the parent carers might be at work, but also uh, care in the sense that it's good for the child for their their development and that picks up on the quality point in the second report. Um, the 245 providers fall into a number of categories. Uh, some are childminders, uh, some are nurseries, um, some are some sort of child care, uh, child group, uh, group perhaps run by a voluntary organisation or originating with a voluntary organisation. So there, there is a range. Um, I should say that nationally, and you'll have come across this in uh, national headlines as well, that the uh, sector is under pressure, um, and they're under pressure from a number of areas. One is that generally their workers are at the lower end paid of the spectrum, um, and if there are jobs that pay a bit more, they will move on and do those jobs. So the income expenditure um, budgeting for the organisations is, is really important. Um, there's also been a change in the way people use childcare with some uh, parents working more at home. So rather than taking up five days a week of childcare, they might only be taking up two or three days a week of childcare, or indeed only taking up that subsidised allocation, the, the 30 hours. Um, and what those who run um, childcare centres will say is that the, the 30 hours, what the government pays is barely enough to run the service and they rely on the hours that cost more, that they charge more for, that provide wraparound sort of eight in the morning till six at night childcare rather than sort of six hours in the day. So um, you'll see threaded through this, there is pressure on the organisations. Um, you'll see on the in the table on page 52 and 53, the changes where registrations have closed or where some have opened. Um, so we are seeing... Um, new registrations coming through, um, holiday clubs, full daycare, um, and some child minders, but they're, at, um, they're not quite as many as are closing, but there still is sufficient capacity there for the families of Plymouth. Um, I think the other things, two other things I wanted to draw your attention to, one was that issue about the um, financial viability of running nurseries, is a particular concern in areas of high socio-economic deprivation. So that's there on page 55. And I know um, Sue Smith, who wrote the report, said some of the nurseries in that area have said to, it's going to be really hard for us to keep going. Um, and so we don't have funds to support those nurseries, but there is advice uh, given to the nurseries about what they can do. Um, so that is something important to note because for those socio-economically deprived areas, it's really important for the children uh, to be able to get some good local childcare, and that the local nature of childcare is really important. 
Um, Councillor Carlisle spoke about the uh, reduction in the number of childminders, um, and it seems to be it's a childminders retiring or changing career, um, fewer people coming into, into that profession. Um, and the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to was on page 59 and the table that shows the, the number of children in each cohort. Um, and you'll see those declining numbers. Um, so fewer children in each cohort, a lower birth rate in Plymouth than there has been in the past. Um, so that's affecting um, how many children there are who might want to go to, whose parents might want them to go to childcare. And it's beginning to have a knock-on effect into primary schools having lower numbers. Um, I think the only <coughs> other thing I would say is, you, no, perhaps noting on page 61 in those figures that it looks as though we don't have many four-year-olds in childcare. That's generally because that's when they start school as they move into reception class. Um, so there is also information there linking back to one of the topics raised earlier about the take-up um, of childcare places by children with special educational needs or disabilities. Um, there is the Disability Access Fund applies to children who get disability living allowance, so that helps their um, childcare placement support them. And there is also an inclusion fund which enables the team to support the settings to assess and support prior to a child getting an EHP, EHCP, or they may not need an EHCP, but there is funding available to support those small settings where they might, for instance, need an additional adult for some hours a day. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, I thought the, the best way to do this would probably be to move on to the next report as well, and then we'll take questions on all of it, because um, we're slightly over time. Um, if, if you're happy to keep yes, talking. To that, yeah. or, um, um, I don't know, Councillor Carlisle, if you want to introduce it. Or... OK, straight so, over to um, Annie, thank you. So that second report is about um, early years and childcare quality and child outcomes. Um, so we do have a statutory duty to assure the quality and to support development of quality mm. of childcare um, and early years settings. Um, and as Councillor Carlisle said, we there's a good proportion of the settings are judged good or above. Um, on page 69, you can see that those settings are 97.5%. Um, so a really high proportion of the childcare is judged to be good or outstanding. Um, they are Ofsted inspected, uh, but we provide support both through networking, uh, providing input to the childminders, the colleagues who run nurseries, etc. And if they have um, an emerging concern, they can get support. But if they are inspected and it's less than good, they get support. And that is um, set out on page 70 and page 71, the kind of support that the, the team have offered. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to say was that towards the end of that paper on page 76 and page 77, in quite a lot of detail are the early years um, learning goals. So children are assessed at the end of reception year, so in the year that they turn five, um, and you can see the percentage of children at expected levels. Um, Plymouth, at, this is on page 76, Plymouth slightly below um, England and South West, but not dissimilar. It's, it's not very far out on any of the measures, so it, it is something we want to see go up, and we are working with schools and early years settings to promote that, but it's within touching distance of national and statistical neighbours. Thank you. So over to questions then. Councillor Beer, then Councillor McClay. Um, I'll put a note to myself because I wanted to ask, uh, is, is the picture really true about um, having enough capacity in nurseries and childminders because, um, and I can speak on personal experience here, because I look after my granddaughters twice a week. Um, but the youngest one, we've not been able to get into a, a nursery place until September, which is having an impact on um, nanny daycare. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how sure are you about those numbers? Because there must be lots of grandparents out there who do what I do. Mm.
numbers tell us, thank you, uh, the, the numbers tell us that there is sufficiency across Plymouth, um, that there are places available. What it doesn't tell us is if they're available in the right areas and of the right sort that your family are looking for. Um, so I think there may not be that um, range of choice available in every area immediately. Supplementary, Councillor Peer. Oh, I just got to continue doing the nanny daycare, haven't I? <laughs> um, Councillor McClay. Thank you, Chair. I just wondered what pressure we're putting on national government, perhaps in collaboration with other local authorities, to demand a national strategy in response to the recruitment and retention crisis. Um, yeah, yeah. We haven't yet no, written we haven't a letter been. to, but, it, but we should. Recommendations, yeah, if you want to, Chair. It, it is a real problem, and I think raising it, I think one of our MPs has raised it, but not us as a local government. Great, okay. Another recommendation to add to this, Jake. Uh, Councillor Harrison. I've got a few, sorry. Um, obviously, we spoke, there's, uh, I'm, I'm aware of um, sort of the issue of recruitment across the board um, and having worked for many years in the early years sector, I'm fully aware of the difficulties of, 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 of retaining good quality staff and the amount of work and effort that they need to put in for very, very low pay. Uh, what, what are we doing though in terms of trying to um, support the, the settings to if, they're un if, if some of them are finding that they're untenable and they're not giving the reasons why they're untenable, you know, if, I, financial, if it's financial, what are we doing to try and support, support that? Are we trying to support them with their, their marketing? Um, you know, are, are we trying to support the fact that actually there, were, there are lots of jobs out there that people could be going, you know, we know that there's, lot, there's lots of uh, availability of jobs, but our children don't seem to be in, you know, our people are not in work, therefore that's why they're not needing the, the childcare. But it's sort of a, a two-way, a two-prong attack. If people get jobs, they need childcare, which then helps the early years sector. Um, you know, I'm aware, you know, we've, we've, we've got some day nurseries, we've got 12 preschools. Very sad to see it's just 12 preschools now. Um, you know, and I know that's probably because they're financially not viable. But how are we helping to try and promote so that families do start putting their children into childcare, um, nurseries, preschools? Because as we know, for their development, it's really important that they're in there. I've, I've visited lots of toddler groups recently. And my and some of those toddler groups are lots of nanny day care. You know, that's where they're taking them to the toddler groups, and lots of them are telling me that their child, their the families are choosing not to put their children into childcare. So the you know the, the extended family are doing the work. I you think know, Sharon wants to come in, and then I don't know if Annie wants to add anything. So I think some of this comes back to our the work that we're currently doing around our Family Hubs programme. So really understanding sufficiency, understanding where the hotspots are, not knowing is not good enough and we need to know that and understand what barriers and constraints that complaints, uh, places on our families and through Annie's recent arrival, Sue and the team are looking at that. So, But it, it isn't just about that, is it? It's the overall approach and also le linking into our skills and, and um, work programmes. So I think the, the Family Hub um, programme of work is underway. Um, in the next couple of months, we will have a very clear view, vision for the future, and it will look at the whole of the system, not just parts of the system. Um, so I think that probably, because it is, it is more than just, um, as you're saying, quite rightly saying that. So if you can bear with us, the Family Health Programme, I think we'll address a number of those questions and we'll take an absolute view around the pockets where there is that tension between work, care and employment and affordability. And I, and I think um, we I would point out we've got 70% of our two-year-olds um, in places, which is higher than it has been before. So those are children entitled to... Um, a free a free 15 hours a week um i think in the report sue has written about the work being done with the economic development team to work on having a, a route through to get qualifications to work in child care and i also know the child poverty action group has done some work on 
promoting the availability of nursery spaces, particularly in our more deprived areas. Thank you. One other question. Um, as somebody um, who was part of the graduate leadership scheme, I see that you've got uh, funding available or you're supporting uh, qualifications, further qualifications, leadership. Um, it's not clear whether that's for all, all settings is, and is, is there funding attached to that or is it just supporting them, i.e. encouraging? those, those uh, settings. We might have to get you a written response to that, but we'll do that very quickly. Thank you. Councillor Criswell, and I think we'll have to make this the last question. Thank you, Chair. Um, what I think is really important and is actually highlighted, it's one of the key things I highlighted in this, was the 2022, the DfE um, published report stated that high quality early years provision is a key mechanism for closing the gap between disadvantaged children and their peers and for supporting maternal employment. And what I think we've had a lot of discussions right the way through this afternoon, which has been about closing the gap, has been about issues of those children who are disadvantaged, be it they send or, 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 or whatever. And I think we have to, again, I can feel myself thinking that there, it's, we, we are doing lots of things here, lots of positive things here. I can see and I know that the um, skills team have been, um, been working on this as well. But I think the fact is, is that we have to be honest here that this is this needs to have a, a national change in culture which actually massively values the importance of early years and how uh, working with our youngest children is actually a highly professional skilled job which uh, I think if it, was, uh, if it was respected in the way that it should be and remunerated in the way that it should be, we wouldn't have these fundamental problems which exist not just here, but probably right across the country. People are having the very same discussions. I can feel another letter coming on. Thank you. So um, we have a recommendation from Councillor McClay, which was around... Um, a letter to be sent to the relevant minister highlighting the recruitment and retention pressures on the early help sector and requesting the implementation of a national strategy to address this. Do you want to add something to that? I think I'd like to add something to that about the, um, recognition. About the recognition and the need for high level qualifications and, and certainly recognition for those people who actually work in and work with our youngest children, how important that is. Uh, and how important it is, it's not just short term, it's actually long term in terms of uh, <coughs> narrowing the gap. Okay, I think we can work that in. So if we bring this agenda, these two agenda items to an end, which is us noting the reports, then we move on to the work programme. Um, and well, there's the... There's a three, four items there, um, and I guess for children and young people's emotional well-being and mental health, there'll be an update for the next scrutiny from the select committee, which is happening next month. Um, so that will deal with that, and obviously we'll, we'll include these. But I guess you know, obviously it's at the discretion of whoever happens to be chairing this committee if they want to do those things. And we would add, uh, where have I put my notes? What are the other things I said about adding? To, uh, to the work program to look at absence, deep dive into absence. I think that's really important. Child sexual exploitation update. Where we are with that, and Councillor Preswell. I, I think I'd like some I'd some some um, reports and such, some of the work that we're doing as far as skills is concerned, and what we're doing as far as skills are concerned for our, especially for our, our children uh, who could well become uh, leaks and what work we're doing in order to avoid that and, and mitigate against that. Okay, are you happy to add that? Yeah. Great, so we need to just vote on these recommendations then and Jake has been an absolute whiz and written them all out for me. So, um, hang on because I slightly altered one. Okay, so the first one, which came from Councillor Baraz Delph, was to share examples of best practice, including two or three case studies in relation to school uniform policy via the Head Teachers Bulletin. Um, can I have a show of hands? Is that, is that the right way to do it, Jake? Yes. Yep. Great. Thank you. Recommendation two for the Education Participant 
participation and skills service to ensure students in Plymouth are aware of the accompanying entitlements when they receive free school meals to enable better outcomes for children and young people in the city. And that came from Councillor Tippett. Yep. Yep. Show of hands, please. Thank you. Third one is a letter to be sent to the relevant minister highlighting that the one year support package for refugee and asylum seeking families has not been enough and in, to encourage the government to review the support packages in place and extend those packages. Great. And then just bear with me while I go back to number four, a letter to be sent to the relevant minister um, uh, expressing the committee's, um, what would the wording be, expressing the committee's no, because no, we want to say, you know, how important this sector is. Uh, uh, support for for the value of the, you can tidy this up a bit, Jake, but um, <laughs> the early years sector, highlighting the recruitment and retention pressures on the early help sector and requesting the implementation of a national strategy to address this. Yeah, share of hands. Lovely. Thank you. Great. OK, well, I think that's just for me to say a huge thank you to everybody who has been on this committee this year. It's been a real, real privilege to chair this committee because it's made up of a group of really committed and, and passionate members. Um, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the officers and a huge thank you to you, Jake, for keeping us, keeping us all on track. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. And um, good luck to whoever might be doing this in May. Yeah, thank you.